Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, September 13th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the school committee, and I'll begin the meeting by asking our clerk to call the roll. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Ms. Molly Burnham. Present. Ms. Rebecca Present. Ms. Laura Fallon. Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy. Present. Mr. Bonnie Crofton. Present. Mr. Donnie Meyer. Present. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Susan Bach. Present. Mr. Ezehowski. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I just wanted to publicly welcome um, Annie Thompson as our new uh, new old clerk to the school committee. <laughs> um, those of you know, Annie once uh, held this role several years ago and we're uh, grateful to have her back and welcome. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, we now have the public comment period. Is there anyone who wishes to speak uh, during the public comment period? Just uh, state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Sure, Sadie Cora. I live at 65 Sycamore Street in Holy. Good to go. Right. Yes, I just uh, would remind folks will be timing. It's three minutes, so we just ask you to please respect the time. Yeah, of course. Um, so again, my name is Sadie Cora. I um, am a teacher at Jackson Street, and I'm the president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. And I wanted to come today to raise concerns on behalf of NACE about the. Um, the high temperatures that occurred in um, some classrooms throughout the district during the recent heat wave. Um, and so just to give you some of the data that we collected, um, on Thursday, September 6th at 12.40, the outdoor temperature behind Stop and Shop was 92 degrees with 67% humidity, um, which was a heat index of 111, if I'm calculating it correctly, um, which is well above the heat advisory criteria. Um, and what we found is that in many classrooms inside of the schools, the temperature was hotter than outside. Um, and as you know, the elementary schools and the middle schools are not air conditioned. Um, so there were, we collected data in some of the elementary schools. One school, there were more than nine classrooms with temperatures of over 90 degrees. Uh, one with a high temperature of 93 degrees. A kindergarten classroom at another elementary school had a high temperature of 95 degrees um, inside, and so that's a heat index of 114 degrees. Um, multiple classrooms at JFK were 90 degrees or above, with one classroom reached 94 degrees on more than one day. Um, these conditions aren't just uncomfortable, they are by any objective measure hazardous, especially to um, children and the elderly and people with medical conditions um, and so um, schedules and plans had to be heavily modified um, to in some buildings move kids to the air conditioned spaces that were available but um, at Ryan Road there's no large air conditioned space uh, that kids could go to. Um, so uh, what we're here to request is that the district and the school committee put a policy in place to, I, first of all, I think that we need to identify all of the classrooms that reach unsafe temperatures when there's an extreme heat. Um, this seems like weather that's going to be continuing to happen, and so um, there needs to be a proactive plan. My room was 92 degrees at 11.15 on Thursday morning. Um, so I think we need to identify the rooms that reach these extreme temperatures that get hotter than outside and there needs to be a proactive plan in place for where those staff and where the kids are going to go so that we can ensure um, that they're not being exposed to the kind of extreme temperatures that that can occur when it's really really hot um, and I think that if we're not able to do that if we're not able to say to kids and staff you know, we have a place where you can go when your classroom reaches a temperature that's objectively dangerous, but this was the, um, the chart that was shared with, with us when we <coughs> um, that we can't have school, or we have to have an early dismissal. We, we can't be requiring people to report to spaces that are reaching these kinds of extreme temperatures. So thank you. Thank you very much. The next person who signed up is Heather Brown. Okay. <laughs> Yielding back the balance of your time, <laughs> saying, <laughs> saying Congress. 
Okay. Um, the next person is um, Lori Gardner. Lori, uh, what was that? Hillary, Hillary Gardner. Sorry yes. about that. Um, hi, I'm Hillary Gardner. I'm the mother of a seventh grader at JFK. I'm fairly new to this community. Um, the last time I spoke before you was in May. Uh, with the same request, which is please remove the sale of junk food in JFK Middle School at lunch. Please remove this offensive flyer from your website. It is not good news for kids to being being offered um, Doritos, Cheetos, strawberry shortcake, um, et cetera, on a daily basis, every single school day. Um, I have pages and pages of facts that I'd be happy to share with you as to why uh, this is a bad idea. Um, half of adults, one in four high school and middle school students in Massachusetts are overweight or obese. Uh, the incidence of type 2 di diabetes has increased by 30 percent in the last 10 years. Um, obesity will cost the state of Massachusetts $3.5 billion. Most two-year-olds today will develop obesity by age 35. I know the facts aren't fun. Um, a lot of opinions have been thrown in the mix about this issue, but I've tried my best online to figure out what has been done about this issue since May. I'm sort of new, and I really could not, using the minutes that happened over the summer, um, see what happened. Um, you know, I, I also did uh, a little bit of math uh, today as far as some of the items on sale, um, which are very high in sugar. Um, one switch, which is one of the drinks you offer, is about um, seven teaspoons of sugar. So you can do the math, one switch a day times five or times 180 days. Um, children are allowed at JFK to choose up to two items, so um, my calculation is that's over 20 pounds of sugar a year that you're offering them. Um, and while all you're profiting off of it is $360. So I really, um, again, am seeking some answers to these questions. Um, can you please communicate to parents using the facts and not opinion? Uh, it's a very basic English lesson, fact versus opinion. Uh, we want to know what's happening t in food services. Uh, I think the children should be told the nutritional facts of what they're buying. Um, I don't think it should be buried on your website um, on a second page where it, you, know, you have to click forward and back to do some research on it. Uh, parents wanted to know if this program was temporary or permanent. I propose you eliminate it permanently. Um, if you can't, I think you owe the parents of the community some conversation circles about why and how this program came to be. I think the default mode of purchase is that children should be children cannot purchase unless their parents allow them to. Right now the default mode is children can get two items unless their parent calls and leaves a message and says they can't. So that's basically putting the parent as the enemy. I really don't appreciate that. Um, and we just want to know who's profiting from this situation because I don't think the kids are. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? That's all that was signed up tonight? Yes. Ms. Graham. Hi. <coughs> Lee Graham, um, speaking tonight as chair of the CPAC. So I just came from Bridge Street. We had our back to school picnic. So sorry I'm late. It was lovely, but we didn't win the raffle. My family. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Um, two, just two things. Um, we have our first meeting of the year on Thursday, September 27th. You are all welcome to attend two weeks from tonight here. Uh, at 6.30, there's some meeting stuff, we have to ratify our bylaws and stuff like that, but at seven it's just a social for parents to get to know each other, for parents to get to know the administration, Office of Student Services. We'd love to have anyone who is free and interested in attending join us. Um, the other is that one of the topics that's come up among parents right away only two weeks into the school year is the scheduling system for kids on IEPs and middle school and high school. So I'm obviously not familiar with this, so I'm sort of speaking on behalf of uh, close to 10 families who have been just been discussing this in the last, in this past week. Um, 
but the concerns with the way that learning strategies tends to suck up the time so that they can't do electives and they don't have as much choice in scheduling because of this block schedule that the district uses. So um, we've been encouraging parents to reach out to school committee members and I know some of them plan on doing so <coughs> and that um, Evie Holly and I will be talking with Pam and her team, but would really love to encourage the school committee to also think about this. It may be, you know, this seems to be a curriculum issue. This is something that families are really concerned about. And so I just wanted to bring that up here on the, the record tonight. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes. My name is Mary Cowie. I'm also a teacher at Jackson Street School. And I work especially with a lot of children in our early childhood. Um, I also want to speak to the issue of the severe overheating in our school over the last two weeks during that extreme heat wave. Um, some of the especially early childhood teachers shared a concern that many children like kindergartners are coming school to school for the very first time. They want to establish relationships with these children, so they want teachers and paraprofessionals want to be at their very best, at their very kindest, at their most patient, working with children. And children, when they come to school, really their biggest question is, will you keep me safe? Will you take care of me? And we had teachers in classrooms struggling mightily to keep children safe from the heat. And the reason there weren't more you know, visits to the nurse's office and kids passed out with heat stroke was because teachers and paraprofessionals were spending all of their time keeping children safe, spraying them with water, roving around the school, packing into the library. That's the only large air conditioned space in our school. There were times where there were seven classes packed in our library. It looked like Ellis Island. Kids sitting, sprawled out on the floor, teachers telling them, just read quietly, just read quietly. Let's not disturb the other classes. No one, no one was able to teach. So if there's a fear that we will lose time on learning if we do early dismissal in a heat wave, that's naive. There was no time on learning. People were in survival mode. There were children who I taught all last year who really worked hard to keep themselves together. Kids like that, the first week of school in this extreme heat, kids were dysregulated. You know, one of my students from last year bit another kid. He never did that last year. In extreme heat, coming in from the playground, bam, he bit another kid. We're putting kids, a kid felt terrible afterwards. So really, we have to think about the position we are putting children in. And do families know their children are being put in a position like this? So in the absence of a protocol in our district, I want assurance that if there is another heat wave this fall, if there is no plan to keep our children safe and cool, then we must implement an early dismissal policy. I've done some research on this. I was at the Chicopee School Committee meeting last week, talking with union brothers and sisters down there. Many schools in our area, in Hampshire County alone, East Hampton, Amherst, Belchertown, South Hadley, and Greenfield in Hampshire County have all had early dismissals during the heat wave. At least five other towns in the Pioneer Valley have had early dismissals because they have schools without air conditioning and they don't have a way to keep kids safe. So I just uh, implore school committee and the superintendent to implement a protocol. What they do in Chicopee is if it's the second day of a heat wave coming by 5 p.m. the day before, they use a robocall, they, they notify local media. Of course it's an inconvenience to family. Families want their kids to be safe. They need time to make arrangements. So if we see a heat wave is continuing a second day, administration and school committee need to take action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to, uh, to speak in public comment? Okay, um, are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Ms. Fallon. I have two. Um, the first is all six Northampton public school PTOs have teamed up with School Local, school local Northampton to host a community carnival um, celebrating the culture, programs, and opportunities of Northampton public schools. 
It's going to be held on Sunday, September 23rd, between 12 and 4 p.m. at JFK Middle School. Um, the event's going to feature handmade midway style games, uh, fun prizes, face painting, glitter tattoos, inflatable bounce houses, obstacle, obstacle courses, and a celebrity dunk tank with local superstars, John Provost, uh, Joe Comerford, Lindsay Sabadosa, and others. All ages are welcome, and there's something to appeal to everyone. Um, they'll also be hosting a dozen community service organizations offering fun free activities including the Northampton Survival Center, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, Forbes Library, Northampton Education Foundation and more. Um, there, will, there will be food, uh, reasonably priced hot food for sale. Um, the carnival is free to attend and tickets to play the games are 25 cents each or 100 for $20. All proceeds from the carnival will be divided between the Northampton PTOs for enrichment programs. And our biggest need right now is volunteers to sign up for shifts as short as an hour. And I would beg our school committee members to all sign up. I'll send out a sign up genius form tomorrow because <coughs> I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to be involved in promoting our public schools and help out the organizers of the event. Um, and then my second announcement is um, last night I was able to attend the information um, session on the Chromebook device program here at the middle school. It was really, really um, valuable information and I would urge um, all parents of middle schoolers to attend. Uh, there was another session this morning on next week, uh, September 20th. Um, Mr. Pagano, Ms. McLaughlin, and um, Mr. Crestatelli will be available during open house in the library to answer any questions. Um, and then a final information session will be held on September 25th at 6.30 p.m. So I do hope that families will attend because there was a lot of really important information that um, was disseminated. So that's it. Thank you. Any other announcements from other members of the school committee? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to recommended actions. Um, we have a consent agenda this evening that consists of the approval of the minutes of school committee uh, May 11, 2017 and August 9th of 2018. We have field trip requests, the NHS outing club going to Tully Lake Campground in Royalston, Mass, September 21st to the 23rd of 2018. Uh, Kate Dollard is the advisor. We have the NHS cross country going to Hampshire College on September 22nd, 2018 from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, Brandon Palmer and Leslie Charles are coaches. We have the NHS cross country going to Thetford, Vermont, October 6, 2018, uh, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. <coughs> NHS cross country going to Northfield, Mount Hermon on October 13th, 2018 from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m and the Northampton High School Cross Country going to the Twilight Cross Country Invitational October 19th or 20th, 2018. We also have the Leeds Elementary uh, fifth grade going to Nature's Classroom at Camp Chimney Corners in Beckett, Mass, November 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th of 2018. <coughs> and the R.K. Finn Ryan Road Elementary fifth grade also going to Nature's Classroom. Chimney Corners, Beckett, Mass, on November 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th of 2018. We also have um, two budget transfers, a general ed ESP to SPED ASP, and PT to PTA. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Um, if I want to make a correction, a quick clarification to the minutes, would I do that now? Is it the 2017 date versus the 2018, or you're talking about the actual body of the minutes? Yes. Oh, um, I think what we'd do is ask to remove it from the agenda. So which, which um, uh, from the consent agenda, which, uh, which set of minutes is it? From our last meeting. So August 9th, okay. So we'll remove the August 9th um, uh, minutes from the consent agenda and take those up separately. Would you make a motion to approve the consent agenda otherwise? Yes, okay. yes I would. Then. Is there a second? Okay. So all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, um, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, we would now then um, take up the approval of the August 9th, 2018. Uh, and Mr. Hoffman, do you want to make a, a motion with an amendment or a motion? Yeah, I would make, I'd like to make a motion just to uh, correct potentially change some uh, a simple part of the minutes that I think is important. Okay. okay. So on the bottom of page three, uh, into page four, um, 
Annie, I don't know if you wanted me to talk slowly or how to actually get this in the minutes, but I'll, I'll talk a little slowly. Um, where it begins with Mr. Calfin reports, um, there's a couple of corrections there that I think need to be better reflected what I said. So it's Mr. Calfin reports that based on his inquiry with the executive director at MASC, not the state, not DESE, uh, it is Mr. Kuchers, I think that's his name, belief, not my belief, that the school, that school committees do have authority over curriculum as it relates to either curriculum policy and or curriculum matters that impact large numbers of students. And then the examples he provided are those examples that are in there now. So examples he offered included graduation requirements. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you point to yeah. where we are again to me? I thought I had it, but I don't. Uh, page three. Uh, it's item L. It's the bottom of page three. Okay. Okay, I'm here. Um, is the best way to do this, most efficient way to do this, for me to read this, or can I send it to her later and, and just so see? So is that the first correction? That's the only correction. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then um, do you want to just reiterate the correction, that it was not DESE but MASC that he Well, was? okay. So, yeah. So um, Mr. Calfram reports that based on his inquiry with MASC, It is Mr. Kuchar's belief, he's the person I spoke to, that school committees do have authority, this is all new, do have authority over curriculum as it relates to either curriculum policy or curriculum matters that impact large numbers of students. So my note on that, the first time you read it, you yep. said the executive director of MASC. Do you want to have that part in there? That's what I yes. Okay. Sure. <coughs> That's what I said last time, so <laughs> I, I re-looked it. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not making a judgment on anything. I'm just, I want that reflected. It wasn't Desi, it was Glenn, and it was his opinion, not my opinion, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the examples he offered included, and those are the ones that are there, examples he offered included graduation requirements, do you see that? Mm -hmm. um, the, the effectiveness of curriculum as it relates to student achievement, et cetera. So that remains as is. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, so uh, then do you want to make a motion to approve with those amendments? Sure, I make a motion to approve uh, the minutes from August 9th with those amendments, with those changes that I... Um, okay. Second. Is there, and there's a second? Okay, seconded by Ms. Hennessy. Any other discussion about the approval of these minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, <coughs> minutes are approved. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Okay. Um, we'll now move to reports and recommendations. And um, uh, it appears that um, we, uh, due to a Scribner's error, the, uh, our traditional uh, student representative report was not on the um, agenda, but I'm going to now turn uh, to Mr. Diaz and ask him to please provide the student representative report. Good evening. Um, to start off, uh, I'd like to start off with um, our football team kicked off their season last week with a home game against Amherst, and they won, so that's always great. Um, in theater-related news, um, auditions for the two student-directed productions, Almost Main, directed by, MS, by Evelyn Thomas, and Waiting for Godot, directed by myself, um, happened this week, um, and rehearsals will begin soon. Um, the transcript, the high school's student news broadcast, um, is premiering for the third year in a row. Their second episode will air tomorrow. They have all new reporters and crew members and they're very excited to continue with their new project. Um, freshman elections for um, the freshman student government, which includes um, regular student government and their student union, will happen on Tuesday, um, and which will lead into all four <coughs> classes, all four grades, um, going into designing and building their floats for the annual Booster Week Parade for our Spirit Week, which will be the first week in October. Um, that is all uh, I have to report to you to start off the school year. Thank you very much. Now we'll move into uh, the first uh, uh, 
item on the agenda, uh, the budget transfers. <coughs> um, we have first a budget transfer to fund a math study. Um, yes, you have a memo from um, Nancy Chevers in with the transfer. This is to transfer $21,500 from staff turnover savings to fund um, having consultants come in and examine the math curriculum and instruction for grades 6 to 12. Someone like to make a motion just so that we can get it on the floor for discussion? Motion to Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, questions, discussion about this item? Mr. Kaufman. Thank you again. Um, so I would certainly like to support this. Uh, I'm, a, I, I'm a researcher. I do program evaluation. I think it's timely. I think it makes a lot of sense. But I do want to offer an enhanced version or um, strategy to go about it. Um, I believe that the study would really benefit if we put out a request for proposals. I want to make it clear, I don't know the two people that were identified as doing the study. I have, I, I, I'm sure they were selected for good reason. I, this has nothing to do with them. But I do think that um, for a study like this, which I think honestly is, is, has some uh, controversy, controversial background the way I understand it, I think that would really behoove us to establish some credibility uh, and some transparency from the start. So putting out a request for proposals, which is very standard practice, um, I think would allow us to, um, A, look at the range of researchers that might be able to do this work, um, and also put us in the driver's seat um, to establish, like, what I pr would propose is a small sort of development team that puts the RFP together. Uh, and this team would gather input from the high school math department, the high school council, us, NACE, and of course the curriculum office in the development of the RFP. But by doing so, I think we're much more likely to drive and ensure that we're getting the information that we all think is important for making decisions moving forward. So this means like establishing research questions, which you'll often see in RFPs. You know, what, what are we expecting the researcher to, to address? Um, methods to ensure that they capture information from a wide range of stakeholders, and in any, and really importantly, how they're going to deliver that information, so that you know we've all been here for presentations, we've all read 100-page reports or received reports. You know, I like to think ahead of time of how we're going to use this information, what we're going to expect. So. Like I said, the strategy is very standard. I think it would be um, add some credibility right off the bat that it was a team of people who um, had their input around the study um, and also would um, further enhance our transparency on how we went about hiring the people that are going to do the study. So I would like to support the budget, and I think I can, I can personally approve it, but under the conditions that um, an RFP is issued. Um, like to see what other people think of that, as, including the uh, superintendent, if you will. Did you want to respond directly, or do you want to hear other comments? Or I think I want to hear other comments, but I will respond. Sure, obviously. sure. Mr. Ross. Okay. Um, so I, th I am fully in support of the idea of bringing consultants in to give us some feedback on our math program. Um, I agree with everything. Mr. Kaufman just said, and what I so I won't repeat all of that. But what I might add to it is, sitting here, I've heard, uh, I've seen lots of data that suggests that we are underperforming in a lot of ways at seventh through twelfth grade. Um, in particular, some of our uh, groups are underperforming, and I've heard our superintendent say we really want to turn this around, and I fully agree that we need to understand it better and turn it around. So I think this idea of bringing People in who can give us advice on that is really important. And um, not trying to repeat what my colleague probably said in better words than I can, but what is missing for me is the charge, the exact charge to these consultants. And I, I like you, the way you presented it. Um, as I read this, I wanted to hear more about exactly what are these consultants going to do? What is the charge to the consultant? And um, how does our district measure success in math? Um, we haven't talked about that as a group. And before we bring people in and pay them a lot of money, let's, let's maybe define that for ourselves as well. What is success and how are we going to measure it? And who are these consultants going to talk to? There's a lot of stakeholders in this conversation. Um, and I think those things are things that would be really smart to include in a request for proposals. I don't think this is a huge rush if this 
was a process that played out carefully over a year and we came back with some really concrete ways to improve things, that would be a really big success to me. And I don't think we need to rush before we think about what it is we want to get out of it. Ms. Busansky. Um, I, I like the idea that um, Mr. Kaufman put forth of having an RFP, I guess, what, and the way I was sort of thinking of it before even coming into this meeting was I just think there's not a clear scope of work. And, and from what I've heard from the superintendent in the email we received earlier, what this really is born out of is to be able to understand that over the past five years, how has deleveling worked? How has the integrated math um, system been working or not working? Or how can we improve it? Whatever you want to call it. And I don't see that reflected in this memo. And so that's of concern to me. I feel like there's a mismatch between what we seem to be having these researchers our consultants come in and do it and what actually the initial uh, what we were responding to and with the idea of why we were bringing them in and so that to me we could kind of resolve in sort of a really clear scope of work I agree it puts us in the driver's seat we get to lay out a very clear scope of work like we do in job descriptions in lots of different ways here so that would be my suggestion to move forward in some way like other comments or questions Mr. Meyer um, so I think the comments that I've heard are really valuable, especially I think the defining success in math, because um, in any school district you're trying to serve different populations and um, we're talking about cross grade levels, so I think that that's kind of um, foundational. The other thing that concerns me is allocating $21,500 with the belief that we're going to make changes based on that. And I would think that if we're serious about this, that I would allocate $21,500 and more. I mean, we need to set aside the budgetary authority to support professional development, to make changes, to buy materials. I think it's unrealistic to just put the $21,500 and say that we're going to um, be satisfied with the product. Because again, my experience within school districts is that it's very easy to support a study. It's much more difficult to appropriate the funds for long-term change, mm -hmm. especially when you have other competing priorities within a school district. So you know, again, I think we need to define what success in math is, and then we also need to define among the many needs of the district, where does this fall as a priority? And again, um, if, we, if we haven't done that, then I think um, I, have, I have seen the district spend money in the tens of thousands of dollar range for studies that really did nothing to move us off where we are. So I'd, I'd hope we'd address those. Um, and again, to say that there is, um, it, we want to do this um, with, with some speed because these students, right, this is their experience each year. They don't get to repeat it. Um, but we don't want to rush into this and waste money that could be used for other valuable work in the district. Um, so yeah, I would agree with my colleagues that while I support examining what we're doing, that I don't want to rush this, and that I think we do need buy-in from the stakeholders in the process itself. You know that everybody is in agreement that this is you know this is who we're going to go to for the study, and whether that's by putting out an RFP, and this is the information that we're looking for, because otherwise we could be wasting over twenty thousand dollars to have people just dispute the results and say, you know. Um, that's not what we were asking for, or that's not the data that we hoped to get, or this isn't the outcome that we actually wanted. And it doesn't matter what the report is, we're still not going to be happy because we just want to have leveled math, or we just don't like integrated math. And so I just feel like if we're going to do this, that I would like to be really clear about the process, um, the people who are going to be involved in this study, what our goals are, and make sure that everyone's behind that. And if everyone is, I'm fine with supporting it, but I wouldn't feel comfortable voting on it tonight as it's presented. Dr. Um, so I would like to speak to several of the themes that came out of the discussion tonight. First, with respect to finances and timing, um, one part of the thought with this was that if we, I agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Meyer that if there 
this study indicates the need for any kind of substantial change, that there would have to be additional funding, either for professional development, for different materials, whatever. However, um, in order for us to do that, to, to act on that, we would need to know that information by about December, which is when we start the budget process for next year. Um, so that was part of the, the rationale for trying to get something done now. Uh, also with respect to timing, we have another district-wide review going on right now, which um, is very uh, comprehensive and, is, and, and uh, I think we'll be looking at a lot of things and will in itself yield some information. And not having multiple evaluations pile up on each other is appealing to me too. So, um, you know, the notion of having more process and delaying this with the understanding that if additional funds are required, we probably will find out after the budget is already set, which means we may have to move anything that's really big into the following fiscal year. Um, the concept of the charge to the, the committee, or, or the, this evaluation, I just guess I would share with the committee sort of my two thoughts on this. I think that the essence, well actually I have three thoughts. One is, part of this is driven by <coughs> the conversations that are happening in the community about a study was promised in this year and so it needs to be conducted in this year. I really wasn't around when um, the promise was alleged to be made, so I don't have the background. I have tried to um, track that down. But whether or not a promise has been made, enough people believe that a promise has been made, that there's um, an interest in showing good faith. So that's part of um, the interest in doing it now as well. The uh, Ideally, I think what would have been happening when the promise was made if, um, is people would be defining these very questions, right? If you want to do an intervention and see if it makes a difference, you first of all decide what the important variables are, then you set up a progress monitoring system, you do the intervention and see if there was an effect. I know none of that was done. So at this point, I think the important questions are, are the practices of the middle school and high school consistent with the current state of the art around best practice, um, both in the terms of the curriculum as it's written and in terms of the curriculum as it's being delivered. Um, to the, the um, aspect of the RFP, I, I think that's a wise idea. Um, I think that anything we can do to um, make sure that this process helps to address the, the feelings within the community that stem from the implementation of the program um, would be helpful. So I, I think that's, that's a good suggestion. And, and what I really want to speak to, though, is the teachers. Um, I'm, and this is another reason why I would be in favor of um, possibly taking some time to, to delay this process. The, the math faculty, in their conversations with me, have shared that they feel like they're under a microscope that no other subject matter or discipline is. Um, some of them, I think, feel like they're at the point of defending every lesson they give. So um, I'm the only reason that I'm recommending that the study be done at this time is because of that <coughs> community interest in the five-year promise. If it was, um, you know, in recognition of the faculty's concerns, I would much rather study some other subject first just to show it's not always math and math isn't the only thing we're concerned about. Um, so those are just sort of my thoughts on what I heard said tonight. So then, just so I can clarify, so you would be, um you would be amenable if we were to, you know, continue this item to a future mm -hmm. agenda yes. um, to allow for the development of an RFP or to make, you know, a recommendation. So mm -hmm. not sort of to table it until such time that an RFP was ready mm -hmm. to then be funded. Okay, yes. I just want to clarify that. Yes. Um, so I have a couple things. First of all, I don't think I, I want to address some of why I think the community is so concerned and give a little more history on this. Um, I was pretty concerned five years ago when the discussion was happening and I was present at a lot of those and I'll provide what I think happened. Um, 
But I also don't want to leave and just table this. I think it would be important as a group for us to decide if we are going to move forward with an RFP, what does that look like? What group of people is going to convene to think about how do we define success in math and how do we bring in these voices so that we stop, the teachers stop hearing this, right, and we can move forward. Um, what I recall from five years ago is there were two really major changes made. One was um, math was essentially deleveled from seventh to ninth grade and um, the curriculum was changed. So. Um, it wasn't until 10th grade that students had an uh, option of taking, say, more advanced math than what our district said was the level for that grade. And there was also a major change in curriculum. And I think it's easy to confuse those two things. They're both pretty <coughs> dramatic changes and they happened at once. So it's also very hard to study the effects of either of them by themselves. Um, but. That's what happened, and people are concerned. I, I've talked to a lot of educators at a lot of different top performing schools, um, particularly math, middle school math teachers, and my, the experience of what I hear is what we're offering is not necessarily at the same expectation level as a lot of top performing schools. And whether or not that comes out, I think it would be great for consultants who understand statewide what's going on to come give us some feedback. And I. I would really like to hear it. I don't have a preconceived notion of what we're going to hear there. And I don't see that we can judge ourselves in those areas. Now, why is math important, more important than, say, English or these other subjects? Um, well, we made these really big changes. And, and we didn't make the same big changes five years ago and tell people. People were told this is going to be reviewed in five years. And I agree with Dr. Provost. How do you review something like this when so many changes were made? But what I can look at and say is um, when, I, when we met with the AP teachers, those of you that were there, one of the conversations was, why are we not ranked in the US World News and Report? Um, why don't we even qualify to be considered to be ranked? And looking into that, the teachers agreed with me. It's <coughs> hard to tell exactly how you get qualified, but it's our math scores. And since then, I've analyzed our MCAS math scores and our English scores, and our math scores are consistently lower than our English scores. And that is the one criteria that's keeping us out of being ranked among the outstanding schools in Massachusetts. So for me, that's a reason why I think we need to look ahead at, some of the, the, at what we're doing in math. I think we have some phenomenal math teachers in this district, and I would really like to see a community work together and support each other, parents, students, school committee members, teachers, and say, let's bring the right people in to help us help all these scores up. And the final thing I'll say is five years ago, parents were told the major, a major reason for changing this math is um, we have too big a range of how kids are performing. Kids from various underrepresented groups are not present in these advanced math classes. And that it was one of the big reasons, and it's a good reason to try to change something. But we saw data at the last meeting, or two meetings ago, it hasn't changed. Uh, these, the students we're trying to reach are not in the AP classes, and they're not doing advanced math. And I think all of these things should be part of what goes out to consultants that we bring in and say, these are the things we care about, these are the things we're trying to change, what are the best practices around these things and how do we make it better and not make it parents against teachers, make it let's work together and get everybody's needs met. And so I really think we do need these consultants, but we need to define it better. And personally, I'd like to see some sort of subcommittee, maybe, I don't know what you call it, um, of these, with representatives from these different groups come up with what means to be successful in math and what we're gonna ask these outsiders to help us figure out. So I think the challenge um, tonight is we won't be able to write an RFP tonight around the table. So right. we do have to deal with the matter that is on the agenda, which is the transfer of money, the request for a transfer of money. So either we just withdraw it completely for tonight um, or we vote to continue it. Um, we just need to deal with what's on the agenda because we didn't post on the agenda that we'd be developing an RFP and so we, that would have to be figured out in a different setting and brought, maybe a proposal can be brought back at a future meeting for how that gets accomplished. So, um, Can you just explain that? So for the RFP that 
that number value isn't necessarily meaningful to us anymore. Is that is that part of the problem? Because we don't know if anybody who comes in under it will will bid twenty one whatever we put in for the budget transfer. Is that well, part of the problem? Well, I don't think this is a situation where we're asking for competitive bids to try to get to the lowest bidder. Okay. So I think it's where we're trying to the describe the scope of work and saying, well, it's public knowledge now how much money we have available and see if we get bidders that uh, who come in at that rate. Or so we can could conceivably vote to transfer the money and then make it pending on the RFP process? I'm just trying to figure out what our options are tonight to move forward. If we're all in agreement that as long as there's an RFP issued that we would approve that transfer, would that make it easier? Or do you think that an extra month to just table this for now and vote at another meeting? I'll defer to the superintendent. I don't think there's any functional difference between doing it either way. Since it will have to come back to, the, you know, there's going to have to be a follow-up discussion at a future okay. meeting anyway. So. I, I would like to address one thing that, in, in, so, if, you know, part of my charge with Nancy, I guess, will be to try to work on this. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about the idea of defining what success in math is, um, because I want kids to be have success in life. You know, and, and math fits into that. So I think the question is, how to, what type of math education is going to set kids up to be able to take best advantage of the opportunities that exist in the world? Um, I, in other words, you know, you can have, and there have been at times societies that had many brilliant mathematicians that were doing pretty atrocious things because there was success in math, but there wasn't success in the whole person. Um, so I guess I would just want to throw that out to the committee for their consideration as we as I think about this. Ms. And in terms of sort of success in math, we know that the state has a measure of success, which is the MCAS that kids need to pass. And is that is that our is that the the end of the road? Is that the end of the road? In certain ways, um, you know, there are many school districts I think that would say that that is the end of the road. Um, and there's the all the conversations around teaching to a test and things like that, which I don't. I'm not saying that Northampton does that. I'm just bringing it up as like, oh, that's another, that is a measure that a lot of schools would use. How many people are passing? And that is the data. A lot of the data that we're looking at is that question, too. So if I can just, yeah. that's why I bring up the point. Yeah, no, you know, exactly. I, yeah. I would not feel very successful if I had a lot of advanced students on math who couldn't participate in democracy, who, you know, didn't have life skills, who didn't, you know, who didn't get a value out of knowing math that allowed them to really benefit from what our society has to offer. I'm concerned about the money. Um, what uh, Mr. Meyer said around if something about a study in and of itself isn't useful, if we can't afford to act on it. And so my concerns are around math. What, I don't know how to define success. And I think of top kids who are really high performing, and I more think, frankly, of the kids who are struggling in special ed and what's best for them. And I think that's really hard to measure success. Um, and when we look at scores, um, I, I don't, I, I love what you said about um, wanting to be an outstanding school and whatever news, whatever it was. But I don't, to me, that's, it, it's not, as important as what we're showing our community and what we're doing. And I think our failure among students of color and special needs students isn't just in math, it's across the board. So I'd, I'd personally rather devote finances to looking at race and class and saying, well, wait a minute, this isn't just a math issue. Because I'm looking at Northampton public schools and our high school and I'm seeing unbelievable college acceptances. Um, I get presented at my school about Northampton High, unbelievable um, numbers of students taking AP tests, which we're going to possibly have a change next year because we're not, you know, and that's fine. I think it's good that we're not requiring it, but that data is going to be different to look at. So I know, I, so my, where I'm confused, it's a money thing. I get, I'm concerned about that. I'd rather devote money to race. I'm studying that and looking at what are we, why are we failing our students? And, um, poor students, kids of color, special needs students. And I'm not saying failing. Yes, I am saying that. I think we need to do so much better. And then I have one other point, um, and it slipped my mind, but I don't know why. But so that's the money thing for me. 
Um, and yeah, I, there was another really important point I wanted to make, but it's not that important. So thank you. Come back to you if yeah, it comes to you, Ms. Voss. I agree with what you're saying, and um, at the same time, I'm going to go back to math specifically. Um, math is a tool in a lot of ways to succeed in life, and I, I appreciate what you're saying. I think almost any kid going through this um, school system is getting a really good, broad education. We have phenomenal teachers, so I'm not saying you should only be successful in math. I'm trying to say we want to provide an education where every kid can be truly competent in math to move forward in this world and take advantage of opportunities. And very specifically, you know, if you want to go to college and you want to study engineering or some of these other fields, Harry, you need to be good at math. Filthy. And not everybody wants to do that, but we need to provide a structure that enables kids to do that if they want to. And to go back, um, I, I think my concerns are more around this idea that was presented five years ago that okay de we had some we had math that was leveled that doesn't mean tracking that means a, at a given point in a given year kids are put together based on the level they're at it's like reading groups in elementary school and I've talked to enough teachers in this district to hear that it's really hard to differentiate in one classroom with this broad range of what we have in math. And it's also pretty uncommon in some of the higher performing schools for that to be the model, okay? I don't know, I've, I've kind of talked to people who's, who are listed on these lists of the higher performing schools. And maybe that's where the consultants come in to help us out. But um, I, I think we could be doing better. I think there's a lot of families um, and children who feel like their kids really like math and are getting turned off by it because the model is if you're good at math you can sit in the classroom and not get a lot of attention and you can help the kids who are struggling with math and while I think that's okay sometimes that is not fair to a kid to have that expectation on them in the classroom day after day after day and for some of those kids to not have um, the attention of the teacher and the expectations that, that where they can perform and I don't know the solution, but I think it's a real problem. And getting some help solving that problem um, isn't just about, it, I'm not trying to make kids just be successful at solving equations. There's, this is a much bigger picture. Okay, so, um, yes. No, I was just gonna bring up, um, from just a perspective on that, I really would, that any notion of success not be tied to, to scores on standardized tests. And part of the reason is when I was when I attended the conference this summer with and Rob Curtin from um, Desi spoke, one of the things that he said was that, that it was under consideration that in fact the the tenth grade MA, um, MCAS were too easy and that they were considering making them more difficult. And I, I don't know if you know anything more about that, Lonnie, but but so the fact that they that those can that that goalpost keeps moving for us makes me reluctant to tie any notion of success to a certain level on the MCAS in any way. Like I really do would like to have it defined, you know, from our own kind of homegrown perspective. <laughs> um, and that just I need to caution the members that this is a budget transfer request so I don't want us to get too far into a deep policy discussion so I just want to be clear but um, I can't don't know who had their hand up first like three went up first so um, I'll start from there and work our way back sure mr. cop and you so um, regardless I mean I, I so yeah I think some of this is a really great discussion some of this would be a really appropriate discussion for the community and or an appropriate subcommittee to have um, but I'll just say that um, you know, when, when we made the change, neither you or I or here, Dr. Provost, but when we made the change, it must have been because there was a, there was a concern and the expectations of the outcomes or the differences people wanted. They, they didn't want the status quo, they wanted something changed. So as you said, I mean, I couldn't agree more that at that point, we probably should have said, what are our expectations moving forward? And I'm glad to hear you say that because um, as, as I said last week, I love the new initiatives that you're putting in place, like PBS at, PBIS at the, at the middle school and a, a standard code of conduct. And if that hasn't been done already, I would more than welcome you know, having that discussion with you or anybody to say, okay, what do we expect? And it might only be two or three or four indicators, like all kids are 
you know, consequences go down or uh, suspensions go down or suspensions don't, don't differentiate by gender or ethnicity, but it's really important to keep the eye on the prize and then we can get updates and then we can celebrate success and then we know what we spent that money right and if we get the same data five years from now, three years from now, we know something else. It's time to change. So I applaud your thinking and I think that's, let's, 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 just, let's think of that as lesson learned and let's move forward with the initiatives that we're putting in place and I certainly welcome having that discussion with you or the right subcommittee. Well, I just want to um, make a comment on standardized testing. Um, I agree that we shouldn't put everything into standardized testing, that it should not be a high stakes test that kids are stressed out about. At the same time, if you look at some of these MCAS questions in math and you look at what it takes to get in the lower 25% or to get in what they consider, I guess, passing 50% and on, they're very different. Those children performing in those two levels are performing very differently. And in order to be a citizen of today, you really need to understand a certain amount of math. And there are, we have 25% of our eighth graders in that lowest quadrant. And we need to figure out how to bring them up. And I know the MCAS is changing. And I think it's, I think, um, I know there's ways around that. And so for example, I've made these plots. You can see where we fit, not in terms of the percent of kids that met a certain amount, but where do we fit in the state? What percent do we land in the state? And that doesn't change, okay? I mean, that, that doesn't matter if how many kids pass at different levels. We can certainly compare um, even though the test changed. I'll leave it at that. I'd like to ask Dr. Provost, would you, um, would you like to withdraw this budget transfer request mm -hmm. this evening? I'd be happy to. Okay, so we'll just, just uh, there's been a motion made, but I'm going to, if, if he wishes to withdraw it, then I sh we should allow him to withdraw it. <coughs> there's also the alternative of a motion to postpone until October 11th. We certainly could. I just don't know what the timing is. Um, we certainly can do that, but he could also withdraw it and bring it back in a different form. I'm not sure. We could certainly postpone it till October 11th. Motion to postpone could be, I, I would, I'd be happy to take, I mean, again, just to set a date so that we have a target Okay. so that we don't lose sight of it, mm -hmm. so that also that school committee members can communicate with Dr. Provost in the interim about their input as to individually, obviously since we can't deliberate as to what their expectations might be around this proposal going forward, and then with luck we would come back and have a brief discussion and mm -hmm. move forward. So with luck. If, make a motion. I, so the motion, <laughs> the motion to postpone has to be to a date certain, so we could say I, I'd move to postpone until October 11th, 2018. Of course, we could always postpone if that proved an opportune time. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion on the move to postpone? All those in favor? Oh, Ms. Busansky. I'm just curious, Dr. Provost, would you prefer to withdraw or postpone to October? They can't withdraw because he's not the movement, so yeah. it, it would be up to... Pardon? Uh, procedure. He, well, he, he doesn't make the decision about the budget transfer It's the school committee. Yeah. I understand that. I'm just asking his opinion. I'm just saying in terms of... Yes. He can Before I vote, I just was curious yeah. about his opinion. So I, I think in terms of parliamentary procedure, Mr. Meyer is correct. And, but I'll just, to answer your question, say again, functionally I don't think it makes a difference whether it's, a, <coughs> whether it's deferring it to the next meeting or whether it's just withdrawing it and then with the understanding that I'd be bringing it back to you at the next meeting. Okay. But it has had the desired effect of the committee actually taking action on the agenda, <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm pleased we've gotten there. So, um, so there's been a motion made and seconded to postpone until the October meeting. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have another budget transfer. Uh, this is for a uh, ESP position at JFK. Yes, um, we're asking you to transfer 18000 to fund this from the tuitions into the ESP salary account. You have a backup memo from Dr. Plummer that explains the reason having to do with some students that were not identified at the time of the budget. Is there a motion on this one so we can get it on the floor? A motion to approve the budget transfer? So Make moved. It. Is there a second? Second. Are there any questions or discussions about this uh, relative to the memo? None. All those in favor of the transfer, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that uh, transfer is approved. Uh, next we have a um, 
uh, we have a vote. Uh, this is uh, to surplus some FM equipment for sale uh, at East Hampton Public Schools. Ms. Walls. Yes, again, you have a backup memo from Dr. Plummer explaining that this was an FN system we had purchased for a student who has since moved out of town. The student still has need of the system, so she's recommending that we sell it to the school district the student transferred to. And she's explained the reasoning for the pricing. So I guess it would be a vote to declare it surplus and agree to the sale. Is there a motion for that, please? So moved. Second. second. Okay, so there's been a motion uh, made and seconded to surplus the FM equipment and then sell it to East Hampton Public Schools. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, the next item is a vote to increase uh, a gift amount for athletics. As part of our budget proposal back in the spring, we basically accepted as part of the budget that the booster, Northampton Athletic Boosters, would be coming forward with a donation of $21,400 to fund various uniforms and facility upgrades. When the boosters made the donation approximately a week or two ago, they actually were able to give us a $25,000 donation. So we thought we needed to come back to you to let you know, both publicly and for a vote, that the donation was more than we had expected. The difference is being applied to field hockey uniforms for the team. Um, so we're basically tonight asking you to accept the additional, uh, additional donation from the NABC. Okay. Is there a motion on this one, please? to um, approve the increase in the gift amount from the NABC. Second. So basically we're accepting a larger gift than, than the one we originally <laughs> accepted. <laughs> just, just, just so people understand what we're saying. What's that? Just nothing. No, yeah, we, just, we voted to accept a gift and they want to give us a bigger gift. So <laughs> who's going to argue with that? Um, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, great. And again, thank you to the uh, Northampton Athletic Boosters. Um, next, we have a vote to accept a gift to the robotics program from National Grid. Yes, National Grid is very generously offering us a gift of $5,000 that will fund the robotics team registration for the coming year. Is there a motion to accept that gift? Move to accept the gift from National Grid in the amount of $5,000 to the robotics team. Second. Been a motion made and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So thank you again to National Grid. Um, we have now a series of reports. Um, I was actually just for cons uh, flow, I was going to ask, we would switch F and G around, because um, right now we have uh, Mr. Meyer, Ms. Fallon, Mr. Meyer, Mr. Fallon. I just thought it would make sense to just have Mr. Meyer go, and then we'll move to the uh, to the Fallon portion of the agenda. <laughs> um, so uh, I would ask uh, Mr. Meyer to please deliver the report of the Budget and Property uh, Committee meeting of September 5th, 2018. Okay, I'd be happy to. And again, to note that there is no vote on the agenda for tonight, so if you... Um, Again, we are deliberating, but um, you will have time to persuade all of your colleagues as to what choice the district will make going forward at our next meeting. Um, so there was a meeting, and one of the agenda items was to discuss uh, the current offerings, the budget situation for, for the uh, food service in the district, and uh, to lay it out first in terms of the finances. Um, some districts have self-supporting food service, uh, food services. We do not. We subsidize it to the tune of about forty thousand dollars a year. Um, selling a la carte items potentially raises thirty-eight thousand dollars a year as a way of uh, reducing that subsidy. Um, the other way that we could reduce that subsidy would be to increase lunch prices. So one of the, you know, we have, a, we issue, we have an issue potentially of uh, having that subsidy increase because food prices are going up, food service costs for staff are going up, um, and so the subsidy is most likely to increase going forward is what we heard from, um, from our food service directors, both past and our present. Um, as a way of closing that gap, um, one way would be to move forward with these a la carte sales. 
Um, we did not sell them through the full year last year, but um, Ms. Walczyk Walz said that we would probably you know, be able to raise $38,000 to close the gap. Um, another thing is to increase lunch prices, and I know that you all received an email from a, a concerned member of the community um, that there are many people who are squeezed, um, who are not going to receive um, free or reduced lunch, um, and that any increase in lunch prices is something that they will feel. Um, so the, the, the question for me would be, if we do that, what portion um, of the $40,000 would we try to make up? Now, the food service director um, did tell us that there's probably a, a limit on how how much we could raise those prices within a year. Um, the thought was that we're at currently 275 for a lunch, <clears throat> that to close the gap we would have to move it by 50 cents. That's not something we could do quickly. It's not something I think that any of us would support doing quickly. Um, the other possibility that we discussed was to continue the contribution that we're making and even potentially increase it. Um, and, and so this is, a, um, again, the tens and thousands of dollars add up, but as a percentage of the budget, this is fairly small. And if we think that health and nutrition is an important priority, then we need to um, potentially contribute more money to it. Um, outside of just those, you know, that sort of menu of how we would reduce, uh, reduce or eliminate the subsidy to the food services um, revolving account, was the the larger question of uh, of health and wellness for our students and for our community. Um, we have a wellness policy, and um, in terms of, you know, let's say not the highest nutritional value foods, um, those foods come into our schools in a variety of ways. Um, they come in through bake sales. Uh, they come in through, previously, they came in through sales that were done to raise money for, you know, for PTOs. And we as a school committee, uh, it was suggested that we would need to address our wellness policy. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, the additional support um, in terms of education and food service staff so that food service staff are not just cashiers, but food service staff are actually helping kids to make healthy choices. And that actually means you're not saving money um, you're actually increasing their participation in having kids make the best choices they can make. Uh, you know, and the other thing is um, physical activity is, a, is part of this. And so we have talked as a school committee over the years about extending the elementary school day, extending recess times, extending the amount of physical activity for kids, and of course that has a dollar value. But it's probably not meaningful to speak about this um, if we are you know, just speaking about the food part. Um, and another significant part of the discussion um, that Ms. Ben Ms. Pesansky might want to address more was um, increasing our attempts, and we're already doing some of it, but increasing our attempts to do outreach to bring organic local options, um, healthier options into our schools, which again is not, you know, is not something that may cost less. I mean, maybe it will, but it maybe it would cost more, and then we as a school committee would have to take that upon ourselves. Again, it comes back to what I said before about um, in, in a school budget with a lot of competing priorities, where do we place this as a priority? And again, I mean, for me, from personal experience, a number of years ago, we had an $80,000 bill to change start time to allow kids to get more sleep um, and the school committee decided not to do that, and part of the refrain at that point was that it was a personal choice. The kids needed to exercise better sleep hygiene. Um, and I, I was a little skeptical about that, but again, you know, I think that we're on the same, you know, horns of the same dilemma. Um, there are certainly some people who would say that, you know, a prohibition is not the best educational, you know, Part, but then again, we have a public health professional who says that you know choice in this matter is sometimes a fiction because people don't have the same access to resources. And so, um, you know, to the extent that we have control as a school committee um, and that our staff have control over these things, then we we really can't beg off this question. We need to make a decision mm -hmm. about what we're going to do going forward. Okay. 
So could you just, again, just quickly summarize the, you mentioned the budgetary choices. Could you just go review? Yeah, so, so the, <coughs> the budgetary choice at this point is 40,000, but I believe there is potentially another, uh, last year because of, of scheduling around um, lunches, there was an additional $16,000 in staff time. Um, that was related to lunch scheduling and, and outdoor, you know, time and how how students were moved in and out of lunch rooms. Um, so that brings it up to fifty-six thousand dollars. As to how that sixteen thousand dollars will be apportioned, will some of it be absorbed by building budgets? Will some of it be absorbed by food service budgets? That's not yet determined going forward. But we're you know so we're looking at somewhere between forty and fifty-six thousand dollars, and that's assuming all costs are status quo, which. We don't know that they will be. Um, so again, $38,000 was the projection for a la carte sales going forward. Um, and I won't say as is, because um, when we were talking to our, 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 cu our current uh, food service director, um, she had already recognized that offering items, um, Mr. Hanna, there are certain items that are offered with formulations that cannot be purchased in stores. And so, you know, she felt as someone who has long experience as a dietitian, both in hospital environments and in food service in a school district, that it's not, it's not really something that she could support to allow kids to eat something at school and then think that they could go home and get the same, same item when they can't. Um, because the formulation is only made by the food companies for food service. Um, and so she was, uh, you know, she was going to move away from those items and offer things that she felt were consistent with, you know, as being part of a good diet, of a good a holistic diet, um, but only if the students could get the same product at home. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this is- Could you give an example just so the public understands? Um, Doritos like Doritos, yeah, the chips. The, you know, the chips were one, it was a chip, a chip formulation um, that if, if the student said, I really want those chips, mom, I ate them at school, that, the parent buying the chips would be buying a different product. Yeah. That, that that product was not available to them. Um, so, you know. So again, um, the bottom line is is we have this forty to fifty six thousand dollar gap that we need to think about. And um, again, we have fifty. You know, somewhere from zero to fifty cents of lunch price increase. Um, lunch price incre Lunch prices have been static for you know for a number of years. Um, we have to think about the policy there. Uh, we ha also have contribution. What is the appropriate contribution? Dr. Provo shared, um, you know, his experience at being in districts um, where the lunch, you know, food services actually produced money for the district. Um, so, you know, we need to think about what's the appropriate contribution there. Uh, we need to think about a la carte sales. Is it appropriate for them to produce any money? Um, if, you know. And then the, the bigger picture is the wellness policy activity um, that, that we need to consider as a committee. But I think you know, the, narrow, the narrow thing is that forty dollars to $56,000. And again, the, you know, if it was the school committee's pleasure, we could just say divert $56,000 uh, and continue doing so and eliminate, you know, we don't need a la carte sales. Um, or we could say you know, just raise lunch prices until we close the gap. Um, or we could, again, pick from that menu. Um, so the a la carte sales, I, I feel like for most of us, the primary issue was what was being sold a la carte, not just offering foods a la carte. But I understand that that's not our purview to decide what is offered a la carte. So well, well, uh, just to, I, you know, I don't, I don't have um, my notes in front of me exactly, so I don't want to, but don't want to misquote. So Miss Walchuk, you could, you could share. The, the numbers in terms of what were sold, you know, we had the chips which were somewhere in the ten to twenty thousand dollar range and we had, you know, another snack food that was in the ten to twenty dollar or ten to twenty thousand dollar range and then we had the oranges which was <laughs> two hundred a year. Yeah, like two hundred dollars on the zero to a thousand. So in terms of driving preference, I mean you have this issue and, and any of us who are parents know that I really wanted my son to like summer squash. And I love it, and I, it was a terrible episode of me saying you will like this. And, I, and I'm not to say that that's, that's the food preference, you know, the only episode that applies to everything. I'm just saying that we, we need to do education, you know, so we do have staff in the middle school who are standing there as the kids are getting the a la carte items, 
you know, basically interacting with them. Um, but we, you know, to a certain extent, if we're going to sell the a la carte items, we would be fooling ourselves to say we're only going to serve or offer these items and then think they're going to produce the $38,000. I mean, again, that might be something if the school committee wants to say we only offer fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, and we're fine with it making us $2,000 a year, that still leaves us with the potential yeah. gap. I have a question. So one of the things, uh, you know, the federal guidelines that came out, whatever, half a dozen years ago, and then this last year, I think the ones for the reimbursable meals sort of got slacked off, the federal guidelines. Did we, are we still abiding by the previous guidelines or did we slack off in the last year? So I have to say I'm not an expert in yeah. the recent changes to the federal guidelines. I'll just say from my observations of the lunches, they appear to be the same. Candy looks like she is. Is that right? What what I believe we got told is we actually have to go by the state guidelines, yeah. which okay. are stricter than the federal line right. guidelines, and the the state A list, which are the only things we are allowed to sell, really hasn't changed much in the last okay. couple of years. Yeah, and I, and I think m m my observation was like I was thought it was pretty interesting in the in, uh, in one of the emails we got was uh, a paper on you know the sort of a, an annual review about you know the obesity in, amongst in America and. And, and it listed some of the successes in terms of this um, discussion. And one of the successes was school districts abiding by those guidelines. And, um, you know, and I understand, you know, those guidelines um, are not perhaps all the way to the, <laughs> to as far as they could go, but they, those guidelines which we're abiding by, which includes our, those, the snacks, which are causing all this controversy um, are actually by, by a group that's opposed to obesity um, seen as positive development. You know, so, uh, you know, there's a, it strikes me as there's a little bit of, from in my mind then, hearing the same snacks which are praised as being progress in terms of obesity also being termed junk food that we should not be feeding to children it, it, you know it strikes me as okay so it's somewhere in there but it's probably not as bad as it could have been because otherwise it wouldn't be seen as progress and um, so so I'm so, so I guess I think the point that I hadn't even thought about that the idea that the, those that progress is limited if in fact it's sort of like a way to market for things that are available at 7-Eleven. And so I think that that would be a place where I could see drawing the line. So it's not saying we won't sell chips, but maybe we won't sell chips that have the same exact looking package as another chip at the 7-Eleven that doesn't meet the guideline. You know, I, so that we're not inadvertently marketing the, the not as progressive snack while we're marketing maybe a more progressive snack. And I would be comfortable with that. Sort of, that's the compromise line. And I, and I do recall Ms. Stell saying that she is working to, to do just that, trying to find those products that are on the A-list but also can be found in stores and retail Of the same formulation. Of the same formulation, that's right. As opposed to the fatty, salty, sweet formulation. Ms. Boss? Uh, uh, Ms. Busansky can go. I think she had her hand oh, up first. Okay. Well, I just kind of wanted to backtrack a little bit and say that I do think that the Budget and Property Subcommittee was discussing whether or not to get rid of a la carte snacks. It wasn't just a discussion, though we d I did really appreciate and we did get a really good update from the new Food Services Director, Ms. Delahannis, who seems really terrific and I feel very excited about having her in place, no question. But I think that is the discussion and I think that the um, email that we all received today from the um, from Ben Wood from the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts really pretty clearly states that obesity is on the rise in Massachusetts. You know, he writes about how black non-Hispanic adults living in Massachusetts experience rates of obesity that would rank them among the states with the highest overall obesity rates in the U.S. I don't think we can, I think we have to really take into account what the inequity issues here are that we're talking about. You know, he also says, um, our environments conspire against healthy behaviors. We simply can't make this about personal choice. And what we're talking about is having middle schoolers take on that personal choice in these a la carte sales. And I think, I really um, believe it's, it's just 
it's not reasonable to expect that our food services department perhaps is budget neutral. And you know, one of the ideas we did talk about is if we were to raise the lunch price, as Mr. Meyer explained, and you know, from the calculation I could figure out, if we raised it 10 cents, we haven't, and I believe we haven't raised it in over five years, despite the fact that food costs are rising and gas costs are rising and everything else we know about when we all go to the supermarket that food prices are rising, that if we raised it 10 cents, that would be an additional $8,000. But I also look at, you know, Mr. Meyer last week in our meeting brought up a great example of athletics, that we value our NHS athletics program. We think it's important for kids to get have athletic activity at the high school level and we believe it's important at other levels too I'm sure and we at contribute to that athletic program why would we contribute to healthy nutrition and you know as also was discussed earlier by Mr. Meyer we're talking about that we've added lunch periods we haven't extended lunch times but we added lunch periods at the middle school and at some elementary schools is that correct in order to ease some of the burden in lunchtime which I think is great and I'm fully supportive of but that has a cost of it and I don't think that cost should be borne by, we can't expect it to be borne by just kids on lunch who participates who doesn't, and we can't be borne certainly by those a la carte items. But I really feel, I, really feel, I think Ms. Gardner was very um, uh, convincing to me in what she said in her public comments and this email that we all received um, that talks about what the public health um, benefits and what the, hurt will, the harm will be with these a la carte items is really important. And I also think that, you know, one of the another one of the indicators um, that's talked about in this obesity report is um, what cities in Massachusetts have, or I guess it's how many cities or towns in Massachusetts have farm to school programs, and that's 68 percent of Massachusetts. Oh, sorry, school districts in the state participating in farm to school activities. 68 percent. We are currently not one of them. I hope with Ms. Del Hanna's um, leadership, she said we're going to participate in mass farm to schools. Harvest of the month, so I hope we will be moving in the, that direction, and I'm really excited about that and really enthusiastic about it. But when we talk about school food participation, there's a lot of parents that we don't market to. We don't talk about what are the changes or the improvements. And if we did start doing more of a farm to school approach, I think it would really attract a lot of parents to have their kids buy school lunches. A lot of us are stuck in a notion of what school lunch was when we were in school, and we know it's come a long way. And we know we can do a lot better, and we can go a lot further with it. And that is what's really exciting to me about Ms. Delhanna. But we have to do the marketing around that. I know as a parent in Northampton Public Schools, the only piece, the only flyer I received from lunch services other than the menu is, hooray, we're now selling chips and ice cream to your kids at lunchtime in the middle school. We don't promote the other things, that other good things that we're doing or that we can be doing around this. And I think that's an important part. That, taste test, sampling. I know we tried something eight or nine years ago, but the whole world around this has changed. We have a lot more information about what sugar, trans fat, processed foods does to our kids. And I think this is a real opportunity to say, this is something we value, this is what we care about. The data or the facts, whatever you want to call it, is in. This is not, we are not talking about an equal playing field when those kids stand there and have to choose between whatever frozen treat it is and whatever ever apple it is. And we're not doing them any favors. Parents pack lunches, we kids buy school lunches to add on more calories, more trans fat, more sugar to our kids. And it is slowing them down in terms of getting out to recess. Maybe they're not missing recess, but it is certainly delaying them, those kids who buy it, to actually attend recess. It's just, I, I just think we can, maybe at some point we just have to admit that having a budget neutral food services department is not realistic. That is just not really, it's not realistic for many school districts around here. And that this is something that we believe in. Just like we say that with athletics, we say it with a lot of other areas that we care about. So, Ms. Voss. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to try to address all three of the things I, I'm hearing, and they're a little bit different. I'm going to start with the price of lunches. Um, I think it is unrealistic to think we're not going to increase the price of lunch ever if we haven't increased it for five years. And I agree we don't want to increase it to a point where it causes problems for people. But I don't know, maybe it should go up some small percentage each year so we don't look back and say it never increased over the last 10 years. And I don't know what that appropriate percentage is, but maybe some experts could help us out. Um, we all got the email where it was compared that um, Ms. Voss was concerned about the middle class being able to pay for the AP exams and should not want to raise school lunches, I think. I don't want to misquote it. But 
Um, and I agree, I, I don't want to raise the school lunch so people can't afford it, but something that's really different about the AP decision and the school lunch is the APs are now optional, and school lunch is optional. Um, nobody's saying you have to buy school lunch. Now, I understand many people rely on it, so don't take that the wrong way, but let's keep in mind, we do need to, um, charge something for it and it should go up. So that's what I have to say about the cost. Um, I, I'm not in favor of making huge changes all of a sudden. Um, in terms of what we're serving in the a la carte, we've heard from several speakers, we've received several emails. Um, the government guidelines are what they are and then these companies tweak them to just barely meet them. And from what I can tell what's being served here and the data that Mr. Meyer provided, um, Kids are buying junk food. They're not buying the healthy choices. Do we want to put money into having healthy choices a la carte? I don't, I don't know how to decide that, but it doesn't seem like anyone's buying it. Um, selling ice cream and chips, we all know that's not good for these kids, and some people are saying, oh, well, they're old enough to make their own decisions. I, I just fundamentally disagree that kids are going to make a good decision about not buying ice cream or buying the orange instead of the ice cream. And in fact, when we were here in the spring, um, listening to the presentation on the curriculum across the different grades, I was approached by two middle school teachers and told that this a la carte stuff, this was the effect it was having. After lunch, kids were wired. There were more kids having junk food. And that's where I say this is affecting more than the kids that are choosing to buy ice cream. It's affecting the whole classroom and it's affecting the teachers because kids are eating more sugar and reacting to it after lunch. And Part of that reaction may also be what was shared with me, that they aren't going out to recess because they go back in line for these a la carte, what I'll call junk food items. Um, and when parents are opting their kids out of this, um, some sort of black market was reported to me as having formed. So kids are selling the a la carte items to kids who aren't supposed to have it. So going back to what we heard this morning, I think these are all things that are going on. And I do not um, support this idea of selling junk food. I would rather us budget money to help meet, um, meet our needs. And finally, I have, I guess, a question and a brainstorm about how we may budget differently, which is, um, and maybe, Candace, you can help me with this, but I think I heard in the spring that lunch prices have to help pay for the um, people watching the children in lunch period. Is that right? How, how do we pay for the lunch aid? I don't know that we have lunch aids. The elementaries have recess supervisors. Is that okay. what you're referring to? Um, well, it's those are in the, your school budget. So who, uh, the, when kids are sitting around at tables eating lunch? Teacher. It's school staff or the school recess staff. supervisor. The only salary, the only payroll coming out of food service by regulation are the people working in food service, cooking, cleaning, oh, prepping. Okay, then I misunderstood. There's no supervision. I, there's no supervision. No, no. Okay, no. sorry. Then I was I was thinking ahead. I thought I thought I misunderstood. Then I misunderstood that. I'm not sure who supervises in every building, but there's nothing coming out of the school lunch account except the people preparing lunches and serving them. And cleaning okay. Them. Okay. Thank you. Then I don't have a brainstorm for that. I, I can fill you in on that piece. Or fill the committee on that piece. It's principals and ESPs. In middle school, you have you. teachers. It's principals yeah. and ESPs. So, um, Mr. Kaufman. So, um, but this is such a loaded question. I mean, and this is a, a loaded issue. There's so many different fac factors to consider and what have you. You know, as much as I, I personally, the way I look at this, is I really, I personally agree that um, food and dietary choices should be left to families, without a doubt. Um, I, I can't not constantly remind myself that we're an educational institution, we're a school committee that's responsible for kids' education, which includes when they arrive until they go home, which is some kids after school programs or sports or what have you. And if we could make that lunch program a really innovative um, alternative type of thing, um, we'd be more marketable to families, we would be happier with the bulk, I think many, many people in our community, and all the science that's out now in terms of kids' brain building and their thinking and their aptitude for learning is so clearly impacted by their nutrients and stuff that I think a few years ago I, would, I, would, I wouldn't take this as seriously as, as I do now. Um, I keep hearing about these really, these, these 
very real alternatives that are happening in other schools. So as much as I would like for Northampton to be like state of the art, it sounds like we're behind the times. And it sounds like there's some other schools that we can replicate in terms of how they're doing this. I don't know the ins and outs of the finances, whether they're receiving more state or federal funds. But um, I, I do appreciate what you're saying, Howard, and I, I get that piece. But to me, there's an opportunity here that we haven't really discussed that much. But if we can, if we can move forward with really providing a really healthy, uh, exciting, marketable types of food, the kind of things that these colleges do. I don't know how many of you have been on these school, on these college visits. But so the first place they take is the dining room services. Um, if we can do that, I'm just tremendously excited by that prospect, and I think there's some really, uh, some real opportunities to balance the budget that way. That kids would not only be eating healthier, but they would be more enticed to eat that. And I think that there's probably enough examples now of schools that have done this in the last few years that we could replicate such a thing. So, I mean, I think we can deal with this issue of a la carte or not a la carte, but I would hope that we can immediately get into the possibilities of moving forward with something that is potentially cost-making, more attractive to kids, not only in our district, but outside our district, and um, the most important thing of all, which is that we're providing an educationally sound uh, curriculum, which includes health and wellness throughout the day, including the block of time that kids are at lunch. So I, mean, I, can, I can support op, uh, open, I'm open to rise, raising the prices at lunch. I'm open to continue to subsidize as necessary. I'm mostly excited about moving forward and establishing some real alternatives that are not far-fetched like they were 10 years ago. At least that's what I keep hearing. <coughs> Explore that. Okay, so again, uh, sorry, can I? sure. Thanks. Um, I am, Downey, when you presented this to us, and as you say, there's no vote. I'm just, um, it feels like we end up talking about multiple things when I feel like a lot of what we're talking about is not in the purview of, the, of us, but is the purview of our new food director. Um, and so again, like the mayor had asked sort of what our charge is and could you clarify for me? Well, I, I think clearly the amount of money that we provide is going to limit the options that she has going forward. I mean, one of the things that we, we have a fairly lean um, food service. Um, we, we schedule our, our employees very, very um, strategically, or we, you know, we, don't, we don't have a lot of um, benefits because they don't work a lot of hours. Um, they have, I think, you know, some of the lowest wages of any employees in the district. So again, we, we can't pretend that, that we can get something amazing um, without committing resources, at least in my opinion. And so, you know, if we don't, if we don't, this is a budget decision. This is a budget, this decision. Is a budget decision. This is a money decision. Right. The district needs to decide, or we need to decide, where the money's coming from. It either comes from other places in the budget by transferring it, or it comes by raising it. And we've talked about various strategies for raising it, and Again, you know, raising the prices, we've seen with raising prices, for instance, in bus fees, that we project increased bus revenue and we don't get them because people substitute. So it's not as easy as just multiplying the higher lunch price by our current sales. Um, you might, in fact, come back the next year and find that you're selling less. Um, so, so yeah, so it, it, at the end of the day, it is just a budget decision that we're making. Um. And I guess my question, my follow-up question is, um, and I really would need advice about this, it is honestly a question, would it help us if the food services person, if we invited her to come and talk to us at the next meeting for her input, um, or do you feel like you've gotten it and that she doesn't need to come to the whole I, I would support that because I think she is the person who, you know, she's the person who's going to make the decisions based on the resources that we give her. She will be able to address us directly. And if we say, 
can't we do this for this much money? She has long enough experience in the field to say that's unrealistic in my opinion, in my professional opinion. And again, she's the one who has been working in the field for over a decade. She's, she's, she's the head of health She's a dietitian, services. so she, you know, this is her profession, this is her world. Yeah. So I, I think that she would give us a lot of good input. And again, you know, this is not for a vote, this is for discussion. Mm -hmm. We will hear from the community um, in the next month and if she came back, I think that that would be really helpful um, in, help, in helping us to make the best decision possible. Yeah. I would appreciate that. I don't know how we can. Certainly, yeah. Do you want to? So I was just thinking that, you know, the budgetary issues have been put on the table. So I think the way the item could be constructed is a vote to raise lunch prices up or down, a vote to increase the subsidy to the um, lunch program up or down. And then you could have her comment on what's possible within different within different ranges. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. I, I have one comment. Just just globally to remember that that this budget is part of our budget and when we talk about I mean we're going into um, negotiations and we know that there's investments that need to be made so every every like we talk about the stuff and I'm like yeah 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 and then we're all under the same constraint of uh, there's a global picture of all of these places that we're trying to support and put scaffolds under after he speaks could I go sure. back to that that was that's actually my point I was the specific thing was remember a year ago the the real outcry when we reduced the number of ESPs and to recognize that forty thousand dollars is at least one ESP probably one and a half ESPs or something like that and that if you were going to increase the subsidy say we were going to double the subsidy to eighty thousand you have effectively reduced the number of ESPs by two or three depending and so so these are, you know, these are, these are the kinds of decisions that are made. This is why, for example, the later start time, Center for Disease Control points out that, that one of the benefits of a later start time is a reduction in obesity, as well as improvements in mental health, as well as better academic performance, especially for the people at the bottom end of the achievement gap. Okay? All of that we didn't do it because it would have cost us one or two teaching positions. And so, so you know, this is a new, new era, it's a new time, maybe, maybe with food it's different, but it's the same calculation. It's, it's you sort of really, I think nobody disagrees that being better, having better sleep is a good thing for everybody, that having better nutrition is a good thing for everybody. The question is, can we afford to not have those staff positions? Whether or not we're, you know, and, and that's that's why it's a, it's a very difficult discussion and a difficult decision. It's not, in other words, I think everybody agrees that, that, that both of those things are good, and it, the fact is we can't have them both. So Dr. Burvis has to respond, and then I'll have you. Come and it actually is relevant to both of the last two speakers. I just wanted to share sort of my feeling as superintendent. This happens constantly in my life, right? We just heard approximately two hours ago really compelling reasons why I should be putting more air conditioners in schools, right? But every time you do that, you have to draw from some other resource that's already under-resourced. And so that's the reality which I bring to you every year in a budget, yeah. which you know starts a list of things I want to do, and this is what I think I can afford. And in order to do it, I'm cutting all these other things that we also thought we needed in the past. <laughs> Response. Um, thank you, I, I agree, and I think that's really important to keep in perspective. And one thing I'm struggling with is the other ways to bring money in and the balance of those. So one is to raise school lunches, and we are gonna hear people in the community who are hurt by that. And I think we do need to hear from them and how much is reasonable. Um, and clearly, we need to be raising it every year as costs go up. At the same time, there's some real concerns with the junk, I'll call it junk food, because to me, that's what it is. And fixing our budget gap by feeding kids things that are unhealthy, and Mr. Kaufman said it far more eloquently than I am, doesn't, doesn't fit for me. But then, if you try to look at those things together, those same group of kids, perhaps, perhaps it's different kids who 
are paying 275 and it's not covering their lunch. That's why we have a deficit. We're undercharging for the lunch. I assume that's why we have a deficit. Um, we're, we're bringing in money from only one school to cover the whole thing and affecting those kids at that one school, but where's that money coming from? If where, where They're able to afford the a la carte item, right? But why can't the kids afford to pay more for the healthier lunch? I, I don't know if I, my question makes sense, but there's something mixed up in there. There is a la carte at the high school, too. Yes. Okay, that's, it's high that's school fine. And that's school. fine, Sorry. the elementary. But, yeah. but <clears throat> kids are spending 38, is it 38,000 dollars on a la carte items? That was the, that was the projection because the Ish. a la carte sales yeah. were started. Just for JFK. Is that just for JFK? Yes, the high school is another 40,000. That's 000. where my comment came from. The high from. school we have experience, it's 40,000. So if we have roughly a $40,000 deficit, maybe I'm misunderstanding it, maybe it's more than that, and we're bringing in projected roughly 38k on the a la carte items. There's 38k in our community where people are willing to spend more on lunches. It's just they're not willing to spend it on the healthier food. They're willing to spend it on the junk food. And so there's a mismatch there for me. I, I don't know how to make sense of that mismatch, but there's a mismatch. Um, Ms. Busansky and Ms. Fallon. Um, I'll start with Ms. Okay. Busansky. Come to Ms. Fallon. So I, I guess a couple things. I mean, I appreciate um, you know this discussion obviously and and your just to your point mr. Moore about the later start time it'd be one thing we are moving backwards on the a la carte items it'd be one thing if we were discussing should we start the high school at 7 30 or 7 a.m. oh look all the research shows we should start later let's just keep it at 7 30 what we did with a la carte items was we moved backwards we took a step backwards in time and to me that is a really big difference um, the other thing I want to say is we did not have this discussion just a few moments ago when we were discussing spending $21,500 on a math study. So maybe that's what we need to be comparing is do we want to allow, do we want to spend $21,500? Nobody brought up the, that we'd be losing teachers by spending, you know, that we'd be choosing between teachers by spending money on the math study or lots of other things that, lots of other transfers we've made since the budget, since we approved the budget, we have transferred a lot of money. So I, I, I um, appreciate that perspective but I don't think that that has to be uh, how we make this decision about our kids and our students and their school nutrition in middle school and, or if we are then let's apply that lens to every one of our budget transfers not just the a la carte items or the food services program at JFK that's just this is too narrow that this is all coming up around this one issue and it doesn't come up around the other issues so um, and then the last thing I want to say is I think we can figure out how to, which has come up before, the raising prices, increasing participation. And the other thing that was stri struck me just as sitting here tonight is that, um, you know, we got how much money from National Grid um, for the robotics club? The, we have an amazing booster club that provides how much to our athletics program so that we don't have to contribute more. I mean, we have amazing contributions in this community that we hear about and we accept at every single meeting. And we don't have any kind of, you know, nutrition, recess, lunch, you know, booster club. I know that sounds corny, but you get the gist. <laughs> or, you know, hospitals that are contributing. We have Cooley Dick who pays for a trainer in the high school, which is amazing. They have, they have um, community money that they have to spend. Would they spend it on nutrition, better nutrition in our schools? I think there's just other places we could go to try to, to bridge this you know, gap and that we don't have to, it doesn't have to come back to $38,000 or a $40,000 contribution from the school committee. So I wanted to throw that out there and just keep minds open about this. Ms. Hennessy. Two questions. I just had a problem with the $21,000 for the record. Um, I'm sorry, because so I feel like this is what happened. It's like I wrote to Dr. Provost about I want late start. Like, can we, do, we keep? We found twenty-one thousand for this math study. Can we find sixty-five thousand more? But um, is this? A, are, are we questioning abandoning a la carte for just the middle school or for middle school and high school? Because I just heard forty thousand a la carte high school. Well, the the. This discussion, I believe, was prompted by the I'm, new introduction. Oh, I get that. However, if we are yeah, if we are talking about wellness and food in general, it would well, seem a little it would seem that's the high school then too. Well, right. That would in 
include more. So, I mean, again, it. Okay. No, but when you said 40,000 at the high school. Okay. Yeah. How long has the a la carte program been in place at the high school? Probably about three years. I think it was started by Mr. Trent Baglia when he got here. Um, I'm still struggling with the idea of having to make a decision between a la carte and no a la carte because I'm sitting here with the, I'm, I'm, I know we've talked about it, but there are thousands and thousands of a la carte options that meet the guidelines for the state. If you go to the stalker A-list, there are nuts and seeds and healthy options. It doesn't all have to be an apple or an orange. There are foods that kids are bringing to school, to games, to practices. I don't understand why we had to go straight for the worst options on that list to make so much money. I, w I just don't understand why we're not trying to find a happy medium where we can offer a la carte items that families would be happy with. I get that some people are going to say goldfish or, you know, um, wheat thins or whatever some of the items though those are garbage too like they're you're never going to make everyone happy but i don't understand why we can't keep experimenting with our a la carte options until we hit on a combination that's profitable and healthy because there are plenty of options on there i mean i don't that's where i feel like the having the food service director here because some of the healthier options maybe you're selling them at cost and maybe that's the problem um, but I, I just don't understand why we have to make a choice, why we keep equating a la carte items with unhealthy foods, because it doesn't have to be that way. Dr. Provost. I would just like to sh ask you to ask that question when we have her here. Um, I'll share with you my recollection of a conversation with her when I asked that basically same question. And her perspective <coughs> as a nutritionist was, if you're, buy if you're selling anything off the A-list, they're all engineered to be essentially nutritionally equivalent. So saying one is healthier than the other isn't really the right thing, which is why she said, for me, what's important is that we not sell something that can't be obtained in an, a normal store. Ms. Voss. I just have a comment about the budget and the money and uh, the math. So I think there's one fundamental difference we need to keep in mind. If you were going to fund a math consultant, and it might not cost $21,000, it's a, it, I agree with Mr. Meyer, it might lead to other expenses down the road if we got certain advice, but that's a one-time expense, and it potentially helps kids for years and years and years if you improve their math experience. And I think that's fundamentally different from this or from the late start or from other things where it's 40000 or $80,000 every year. So just, you know, I think we're a little bit apples and oranges. That's there. usually the point I make, so thank you for making yeah. that point. <laughs> I was going to say that, but thank you for making that point. apples and ice cream. No, no, it's fine. It's just um, the, the whole one-time versus yeah. ongoing operational. Yeah. It is a difference. So anyway. Um, Candace, I want to ask you some numeric questions. If you have them, um, that would be great. But um, so like over the last four or five years, how, what, what's, what's the annual amount that we've subsidized um, and where do we get that money from? Do you, recall, do you recall? It, comes, it comes out of the school committee appropriation. But specifically, is it, <coughs> do you remember? On yeah. The amounts? From, yeah. Last year was, last year was increased at the end of the year to $56,000 to cover the additional 16000 in payroll for the extended lunches. Um, probably, and for this year it's 48000 with the hope that the food service program could cover half of the additional payroll and the school committee was covering the other half of the payroll. Yeah. Prior to last year it yeah. was 40000 before I arrived here and I think maybe seven or eight or nine years ago it was 25000 So it's been in that range for a while. So we kind of have it built in now as an expectation currently that we're going to subsidize it. So yeah, we've it's just another important point that we're not going to have to lose a teacher if we... Oh, yeah. No, but the, yeah, the bigger, in, the bigger yeah, issue... Yeah, because you'll be increasing that subsidy. The increasing cost. The increased subsidy for this year. <coughs> this year the, the, the subsidy for this year is based on continuing the a la carte? Yes. Although when we did the budget, there was a big unknown. We didn't have as much detail as we have now. Last year, the program, and you'll see it later in my report, all, just barely broke even. It made a small small profit. I hate to use that word, but it made a small profit. Yeah. Um, basically due to the start of the additional a la carte sales. Otherwise, it would have been a small deficit. Right. Going into this year, there's increased contract costs for benefits and payroll. There's increased food costs. There's, you know, everything else that goes into it. So 
by not really increasing our subsidy to cover any of those costs, the expectation and the hope is that this year that program is going to be able to cover those costs. It, otherwise, it will be operating this year in a deficit. We have some built up reserves, which Department of Ed wants us to have. We don't have as much as they want us to have. Um, but if we run a deficit this year, at the end of the year, the school committee would either have to transfer more money in or mm -hmm. go into those reserves. Right. So the, but the, the money that we allocated for food service this year is, is inclusive of your projections for what a la carte would bring in? No, when it was done, it wasn't, it wasn't a direct correlation. When the budget was done, we looked at what we needed for the program. The middle school a la carte was not off the ground yet, other than the stuff that had been there since the beginning of the year, like some of the drinks. Um, so we looked at it, and actually, I think in next year, in the budget book, I think there's a small deficit for next year projected because we only increased our budget by the $8,000 for part of the payroll cost. I, I'm not sure we're on the same. I think I'm confused because if, if for a series of years now we have <coughs> transferred money at the end of the year to help balance the food, is that right? Yes. At, at various ranges, but like um, 64000 last year, you said that? 56. 56. We started out at 40 and ended at 56. Okay. So in that, let's just say about about 50,000, just for example's sake. So did when we built the budget this year, this is where I'm confused, did we already assume that we would be putting in an additional 50,000 because that's been the average amount of deficit? Or did we not put that in because we projected we would gain X amount of money, it sounds like 38,000 at least from the middle school from the a la carte? We put 48000 into the school committee budget to subsidize the program. Okay. And then we had hoped for additional sales of something. They weren't identified as middle school a la carte in February. Yep. Um, but we had hoped between a various number of programs, including the high school a la carte, that we would be able to come up with enough funding right. to cover the increased costs. And we also have been trying to increase sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. But not to cover the 48000 Right, no, the 48000 was 48000 is baked in. So if we get rid of the a la carte, it doesn't magically get, I mean, it would have to, you'd then have to come up with the additional, you'd have to transfer in 38,000 or 40,000. I'm just saying that that's not baked into that, the appropriation. Right. The appropriation is to cover the deficit that the all sales doesn't cover. Right. Whether it's regular lunches. If, if we were to stop, you can say a la carte at both levels, we would probably need to come up with an additional fifty to eighty thousand dollars on top of the forty eight thousand. Okay. Because we knew we had the roughly forty thousand for the high school coming in, we projected that would continue. Mm -hmm. We had some middle school a la carte coming in even before it was expanded in, at the end of April. Because by the time we, we expanded out the middle school program, the budget was long voted. So clearly if we Ended the a la carte, your projection would be that we would need to transfer addition at the middle school. Your projection is that we would need to, at some point, transfer more money into the food service budget to make it solvent if history repeats itself. Yes, for the current year. Thank you. Okay. So, if I think it's a great idea to invite the food services director to our next meeting, and some of the things that might be helpful are some calculations like if we raise school lunches by 10 cents how much of this deficit we have that already yeah it's, it's less than four thousand dollars for each nickel increase okay based on current sales if you, have, if you have a decrease in sales which is typical when you increase prices it be a smaller amount okay so you know I think for us maybe we need to think about a balance between these of increasing it how much is reasonable to increase it? I think there's probably laws about how much you can increase. Let's no, we actually researched that. There are laws on increases if you aren't meeting the paid lunch equity requirement. We are okay with that, so there is no minimum or maximum that we have to increase. You check that out with Department of Ed. You just have to deal with the local fallout of a 50 cent increase or you know whatever we end up doing. Okay, so this has been a really good discussion. It sounds like the next step is to invite the food service director to come to the next meeting and prepare to talk a little bit more about this and give us some insights as having in the two months she'll have been in the district give us her thoughts on mm -hmm. what direction she thinks we should be headed. In. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you Mr. Meyer for your report. Um, now we'll move uh, to Ms. Fallon uh, and ask for the report of the 
rules and policy subcommittee meeting. Uh, I'm about to set a new world record for revenue. Okay. So um, uh, at our meeting on um, August 22nd, we circled back around on policy FF, naming of public school facilities, hopefully for the second to last time. We've um, devised a new analytical framework for this policy, and we'll each be producing um, a sample policy, and then we're going to vote on one and just go with it and bring it to you. So that's our plan. Um, that took up the bulk of our meeting, and then we discussed the policies that we would like to, we voted as a subcommittee on which policies we would like to bring to the full committee to vote to refer back to the subcommittee. So that was the extent of our meeting, and tonight we'll be asking you to uh, to refer the policies that we um, voted on back to us. Um, and we will be meeting again, um, this date is wrong, on October 4th. Um, at 3.30 in the afternoon. So that's my report. Okay. So then we move to the next uh, set of issues that are <laughs> emanating from the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Um, and these are the uh, second readings on all of the uh, various, um, or the three uh, policies that you had made recommendations to us on that we had an initial discussion of first reading. Uh, together with this whole other set of policies you're asking to be referred to you. So um, so I think then we should probably take up again the first three items. I don't know if you want to just review quickly okay, the so, recommendations and then we go from there. Well, so here's the thing is there were a lot of recommendations for amendments to this policy BEDG on minutes. I went through and watched our um, video from the last meeting a couple times and incorporated all of them into this. Is it possible to read the whole policy as amended rather than to do individual ones? Like I've now incorporated all of the suggestions into the policy or do I have to do them individually? No, you could just, you could make it as a, you know, as an amendment to the, you know, you could make it as a So I can say I amend that we replace the policy that we presented last month with this policy and read it? You certainly could. Yeah, as okay. long as if, if everyone because feels I, comfortable. And then I will have a copy of that amended version if you miss something. Um, but it's really just addressing we had had there were some there was some confusion in the way that we had edited um, the BDG document, but I added in suggestions. So I'm going to read slowly. Um, I would move that we um, amend policy BEDG to read as follows. The minutes of a school committee meeting constitute the written record of committee actions. They are legal evidence of what the action was. Therefore, the secretary of the school committee will be responsible for reporting in the minutes all actions taken by the committee. Minutes will include, <coughs> number one, the date, time, place, the members present or absent, annotated as to arrival and departure times, if during the meeting, a summary of each subject, and a list of documents and exhibits used at the meeting. Number two, a complete record of official actions taken by the committee relative to the superintendent's recommendations, to communications, and to all business transacted. Resolutions and motions will be given in their exact wording, accompanied by the names of members moving and seconding, and a record of the results of the vote. Reports and documents relating to a formal motion may be omitted if they are referred to and identified by title and date. Number three, notation of formal adjournment. Um, I am. Um, the next part would be an audio or video recording of subcommittee meetings will be available whenever possible for review as a public record until the minutes of the subcommittee are approved or administrative use for the recording ceases, whichever occurs later. Copies of the minutes will be sent to all committee members at least 48 hours in advance of the subcommittee or regular meeting at which the minutes are to be approved. Minutes of all meetings shall be created and approved in a timely manner, which is defined in regulation as within the next three meetings of the body or within 30 days, whichever is later. Copies of subcommittee approved or draft minutes will be distributed to members of the school committee for informational purposes. The approved minutes will become permanent records of the committee. Minutes of public meetings and minutes of executive sessions that have been declassified will be in the custody of the superintendent who will make them available to interested citizens upon request. So that was incorporating all of the changes that committee members suggested at the last meeting. Um, 
So is there, can I get a second on that? Second. Okay. So basically you've moved to amend the previous recommendation as you just stated. It's been seconded by your colleague. And then I would just open it up to discussion. The only other discussion point that I didn't include in that is that there was a question. We had a long discussion about what should be included in the minutes. In the original MASC recommend, recommended changes, they add a note to theirs that says note at the very bottom after the cross references. Specific comments and or discussion should only be included in the minutes as a result of a vote of the committee. The minutes are not a transcript of the meeting. Documents used during a school committee meeting become part of the official record and must be maintained based upon their content in accordance with the Commonwealth's municipal records retention schedule and so we had no internet connection at that point in our meeting and someone <laughs> said I remember there was a note <laughs> and we just didn't include it so I didn't know what the committee's sense was as to whether or not to include that note that was on the recommended um, changes by the MASC okay. does anyone have any thoughts about that disclaimer that it's not an, that it's not a verbatim transcript that it's not I mean that seems to be what they're saying right that the minutes aren't intended or required to be a transcript right right I, I think it's a good idea they're recommending it it's what note should be and I would I would very much support including it okay, okay. Um, I would I'm gonna offer an amendment to the amendment oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in the in the in the paragraph which is states that the minutes will include the date time place members present or absent um, and so forth and so on um, and a summary of each subject I believe it should say a summary of the discussion on each subject because I believe that's what the the state um, open meeting law regulation on minutes says so I'm going to add the amendment that it just um, where it's in here where it says a summary of each subject it is say a summary of the discussion of each subject second okay so there's been a, a motion to amend the amendment um, any discussion on that okay all those in favor of accepting mr. Moore's amendment to the amended version please say aye aye, aye. opposed any abstentions okay so now we're back to the main amendment as amended um, and is there any further discussion on that okay so all those in favor of this um, uh, final version of BEDG uh, please say aye aye, aye. <laughs> aye. Um, all those opposed any abstentions? Okay. I thought there was a, a mass no vote there. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'm just excited to learn that we get to declassify. Declassify, stuff. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where it's, it's one of the ones I, has a question I don't see it anywhere in the open meetings law, but it's great. We're going to bring okay. this one back to committee and rework its wording. <laughs> okay, so we have then successfully um, revised uh, BEDG. Okay, so now we'll move to uh, subcommittees of the school committee. B that recommendation um, yes so policy BDE subcommittee the school committee um, the primary changes that were included were to um, have standing committees consisting of a subcommittee on superintendent evaluation of three members rather than curriculum and then maintain budget and property and rules and policy to add in sections um, reflecting our notification from the assistant attorney general that um, subcommittees needed to approve their own minutes um, so to add in a section that said subcommittees shall create and maintain accurate minutes of all meetings including executive sessions etc <coughs> and give the um, time frame in which those um, minutes need to be approved um, and then we just updated the language to include verbs of what the actual um, responsibilities are of each subcommittee um, that we are recommending superintendent evaluation um, to annually evaluate the superintendent and property to oversee um, the financial aspects of all programs as well as provide oversight of property and rules and policy to develop review and revise rules and policies for the school committee staff and students um, and then we just replace language to say school committee instead of board. 
So those were the recommendations that were made. There was obviously a lot of discussion about it, and not everyone was present. So, so could you move that as a recommendation so that we can formally have it on the floor so it's something that can be discussed and, and or amended? Um, so I would move to approve policy BDE as amended. As recommended. As re the amendments as recommended. Okay, fine. I'll second that. There's a second. Okay. So, um, so that revised policy is now before you for discussion, for amendment, for uh, whatever uh, comments people have. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, so I really felt great about the discussion we had last time. Um, I know everybody wasn't here, so if you haven't had the opportunity to look at it or have something else to add, that would be great. I'm sure you did. Um, so. I've been, you know, particularly I've been mostly focused as a member, a current member of the uh, curriculum subcommittee. I, I really enjoyed the discussion we had. There's so many different issues and history around it and stuff. And I did a lot of soul searching. I also uh, represented um, at least Mask, MASC's opinion on this. I continue to believe that there are um, curriculum issues in the way that Glenn discussed it, Glenn Kucher, that there are curriculum issues that are our purview, and I think we should continue to deal with these as they come up. That all said, you know, after thinking about this a lot, I, I'd like to offer an amendment. Um, and this came to being by myself, and I had a, a really nice discussion with Dr. Provost earlier today, so I modified it. But I'd like to offer an amendment to the proposal as follows. Is that appropriate? Sure. Okay. So I'd like to offer the idea of replacing the curriculum subcommittee with a new subcommittee that I would uh, call the Subcommittee on Student Success. Um, and I would define that in, in an attempt to define that using the same sort of ver uh, verbs that you guys <laughs> uh, are using. Um, so to be consistent with other, other subcommittees, my definition was that this Subcommittee on Student Success uh, meets periodically to review and discuss data and supporting materials related to student academic achievement, student engagement, and other measures of student success in support of high quality teaching and learning and positive outcomes for all students. No, it's a big, a big definition. So I thought I'd provide a couple of concrete examples where I think a subcommittee would, would um, be helpful because they're happening right now. Although the math study, I'm not sure it's happening, but coming into the meeting, um, I, I certainly thought that reviewing and pinpointing key findings from both internal and external studies, such as the math study or the review that we're going to have from DESE, um, are really important things that probably could benefit from a subset of folks pulling in other stakeholders and really discussing the salient findings and also discussing ways that we could best present it to the community so everybody has an opportunity to hear. Um, I also thought of another thing which um, the way I understand it, the Budget and Property Subcommittee has an opportunity to meet with Dr. Provost first uh, on their first budget review, maybe that's called. Uh, before presenting to all of us, and, and I asked one of my colleagues, Rebecca, whether that's a valuable process. I asked Dr. Provost, is that the valuable process? They both agreed it was. So again, I can see that as the superintendent annually sort of delivers the uh, achievement results to us as a community, and cast and otherwise, and I hope it's otherwise, that that might be also a good opportunity that he could present that to this subcommittee to really ensure that we're hearing the most important things, that we're advising him on ways to present data, that we're um, supporting him as he makes that presentation because maybe we're a little bit more familiar with it. So that seemed to fit naturally to me. Um, but I want to say, again, this is all about supporting our ongoing work uh, and our primary responsibility of ensuring that kids are finding successful outcomes. Um, and in particular, shining a light on those things that we may not be doing well. So another thing I think that we can, by spending more time on data, and maybe the composition of this group are people like me that are data wonks, I don't know, but by looking at data, it, I think it naturally brings to our attention some things that would really best inform our discussions around the budget and what's working and where we're getting the best for our money. Um, and um, I think it would be a really, really powerful enhancement to the committee as a whole, regardless if there's a subcommittee. I like to do more of this. I really enjoy it. But as a subcommittee, I think we can really dig further. And you know, my research around whether there was any, um, what other school committees have developed 
when I was initially interested to see whether there's other curriculum committees. Um, I did find that there's an awful lot of other committees that are called something like student achievement, student learning, student um, outcomes, or student success. I don't think the name is as important as the definition. And currently, clearly, our curriculum team is, it's, it's debatable to what extent we should discuss curriculum. And without a doubt, our definition needs to be updated. So if we, did, if we didn't accept our, my amendment, I would like to move there. But I think this is a little more wholesome, particularly more valuable, and particularly really solidifies our role in supporting student achievement um, as our primary responsibility. Yeah. I could just clarify, um, your amendment to the recommendation uh, is to then Re not replace, so currently the recommendation replaces curriculum with Superintendent, superintendent evaluation. evaluation. So you would say, in lieu of that, you would replace it with this instead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I would like, to, no, I have no objection to it. So I guess I, I didn't think of it like that. So if I can, I would like to add to. So four, you'd be suggesting four subcommittees? Yeah, is that okay to say? Well, add to? Okay, but I mean, that's what, is that what you're doing? <laughs> oh, no. yeah, yeah. If we're not, if right now we have? Right now we have three. Right. That would be four. Well, we kind of have four now. We're just we're adding evaluation, um, and but then we're dropping curriculum. So if technically we're replacing curriculum with evaluation, then I guess what I'm proposing is adding a student success team. Yeah, I mean, if you think of which way, in, well, that's what I get. Instead of superintendent evaluation, or in addition. To in addition. So so a total of four subcommittees. Correct. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify. I think what, that's what I'm yeah, that's all. I just <laughs> yeah. to get in. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's an amendment that's been made. Mm -hmm. I need a second for us to proceed. Second. Okay, so there's been a second. So now we're discussing um, Mr. Kaufman's proposed amendment to the recommendation of the uh, committee. Thoughts, feedback. May I? Sure. For clarification, we have four now. We were recommending getting rid of curriculum and just having the three. And now well, we we're having, so we have a superintendent evaluation. We have we never had a no. standing. It was not a full oh, no, standing. Right, right, right. Yeah, it was not a full yeah. committee so and it was saying not a standing. We committee. still have a superintendent, but it's not standing. But we replace curriculum with this. That's what you're saying. I, can I, Which yeah. one? Which way? I, just to clarify, I want just clarification. Yeah. The the clarification is is that the the um Superintendent evaluation was never a standing committee, and it was never a three-person committee. So that was what was being, what's that? It was three-person. Oh, three-person. It was just being moved up into the three primary committees. If that's being moved up, yeah, that's one thing. If it's being replacing yeah. the curriculum, that's why. Uh, so if it's replacing, then I my amendment is to add. If it's being moved up, then my amendment is to replace. I mean, I just, I would, <laughs> sure. I just wanted to make sure what was happening. So I need to know, okay. I guess, from yeah. Laura, are, okay. are you, are you does, the, does, the, does the proposal now talk about the evaluation <coughs> subcommittee replacing curriculum? Essentially, essentially mm -hmm. it does, yeah. yeah. Essentially, yes. but okay. you're right. Okay. okay, I just wanted to, it was okay, so you'd be adding this. Curriculum right. And it was okay. adding superintendent evaluation, okay. and your amendment would be to also yeah. add to this proposal, um, Student success. Correct. I just didn't want to inadvertently lose the superintendent committee. That's all. I just wanted to make sure how it fit in. Yes. I still, in think, I still think this is not clear, um, and I just want to say what I think we're doing. I understand. Um, I understand. Yeah. I've, I've read a lot about. This. So there's standing committees. A lot of school committees have no standing committees. Okay. Ours has three right now, and. It's been proposed, so we have three standing committees, and one of them is called curriculum. And it was proposed that we get rid of curriculum and replace it with superintendent evaluation. And what's confusing in this conversation is we currently do have a superintendent evaluation committee. It is not a standing committee. It's in a different category. And what we can discuss how we deal with this, but we're going to have to. The original proposal replaced one committee with another, so there's nine of us, and three of us get put on each of those three standing committees, and that's all neat. Um, and my understanding was, when you were reading this, that you were suggesting putting um, committee on student success. success in place of the curriculum committee and leaving the superintendent review where it was, which is one way to go, or 
there's a different way to go, which is to now have four committees and divide nine people up on them. So just to be very clear, I'm not clear what you think you're proposing. Okay. So what I'm proposing is that we have four standing committees. And um, I just want to point that I, whether it's a standing committee or whether it's in our policy, I always thought of it, I'm a member of the evaluation subcommittee, I always thought myself as a member of the evaluation subcommittee and the curriculum subcommittee, but not the budget and property and not the rules and policy. So I always thought of it as four, and we always, in my mind, it was nine people to being divided into four, so I don't want to, okay. I'm just, I don't want to think of it as another big shift. Technically, I'm confused by all this, but I just want to be clear, I'm talking about at the end of this, we would have four standing, including evaluation, which I'm not commenting on, but I'm supportive of it. <laughs> okay. Okay, I want to now discuss what now is on the table. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> the amendment on the table. The yes. amendment, um, and the amendment is Lonnie's amendment. I think that's. I think that your proposal comes closer to, to sort of when what we when we were saying what's the curriculum committee and what is its verbs and what does it, what is it what is its real mission here? I think it comes closer to what what I, th I think what, what a lot of the discussion we had last time about. What, what's the justification for a curriculum subcommittee? I think that describes that justification better, so I think it's a much clearer sort of alignment of what people were talking about in terms of well, what could that committee do with its name and sort of stated you know, purpose, um, as opposed to sort of saying, well, we have this thing, we call it curriculum, but we're really going to discuss you know, a, a, a different thing than curriculum. Um, and so I think, that's, I think that's positive to you know, call the thing what it does as opposed to having it be. You know, <laughs> yeah, I think that's, so I think that's beneficial and a good idea. Mr. Meyer. It's going to go on the record as opposing all subcommittees. I mean, unless they're ad hoc for a specific pur purpose, I just think having, uh, having a small committee as we have, the idea of subcommittees, to me, um, means that there is another another place where the public can lose sight of or not be able to follow the deliberations that we go through. And again, again and again, we have a budget and property subcommittee or rules and policy, and there's a long discussion, and then it's then it's replicated here. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, and just in terms of efficiency, I would rather that we go back to twice monthly meetings. Um, and have the full school, or as needed, we do it during budget season if we felt it was useful for other things, if we felt that you know, we needed to discuss math curriculum, if we felt you know, needed to discuss the wellness policy, that we would all be here. I just think that um, if we were a committee of 400, um, referring it to a small committee with expert staff on that particular topic makes sense, and then it comes back. But again, then as 400, we would trust the deliberations and and the work of the staff for the subcommittee, and I, I just don't see the benefit in in sending things out again. In certain out, you know, certain times an ad hoc committee can be very useful, um, but I think that my you know my preference would be that we do it ad hoc, um, maybe because things like superintendent evaluation are statutorily required. You know, I could see that you know having that there, um, but again. Um, to the extent we add the subcommittee structure, I think it makes it harder for people to follow. Um, <coughs> if we wanted to have meetings in the afternoon that were more accessible to people who can't make them or don't want to stay up until 9.30 at night watching um, this gripping drama, then I would say we should move our school meetings to different venues and we should move them to different times and maybe have them on a Saturday if we had a, you know, an issue that was of great public interest. Just want to say that. So that's just more of a comment. You're not proposing well, I would, an well, amendment. I'd vote against. I'm just explaining why I'll vote against subcommittee creations. Okay. Yes, Mr. Cox. So I, I, I can directly let, let me share my feelings on that just by building my, my case for this one more in one more way, which is that the, one of the beautiful things I see of this committee is that we can engage stakeholders who otherwise don't have an opportunity to engage with us at these same issues at school committee meetings. So I, I know some, some committees just don't do that. Some subcommittee meetings don't do that. Um, like the evaluation subcommittee, we've never had anybody show up. I guess they could. But my experience previously with the curriculum subcommittee when we talked about AP uh, uh, requirements or fee requirements, that was, a, that was a great opportunity. And I, 
I would hope that, that you know, to engage the full public and the teachers, and I would hope that subcommittees, at least this one, would really go out of their way to make sure other people are at the table to look at data, to, to synthesize data, and then it's not even making recommendations necessarily, but it's helping us to help the community be better, be better informed. So I'm with you. If it's a waste of time, it's a waste of time, and if we're regurgitating something, but I envision this being somewhat different. Ms. Fallon. Um, so we, at Rules and Policy, we have invited other people from the community, depending on yeah. what policy we're revising. Or yeah. Yeah. So that wasn't, that's, I don't think it's unique to, um, to what curriculum has done in the past, but I, what you're describing to me really sounds like an ad hoc committee. Um, and, I, and I do think that we would get a different group of people in for various things. Whether they all had to do with achievement or not, there are different people who are going to be in different interested and experts on different areas of achievement. Um, and so I, I feel like I would prefer to either address those sorts of, I think we are all equally invested in student success and achievement and that we should be looking at that as a full committee. Um, and if there's a specific area that we need to address that forming an ad hoc committee is definitely worthwhile. And I like that the three subcommittee, standing subcommittees that we were suggesting align perfectly with what our resp primary responsibilities as school committee members are, which are hiring and overseeing the superintendent, um, devising and, and um, following the budget, and then um, developing and updating all of our policies for the district. So yeah, I guess I, I don't want to make it more complicated, mm -hmm. um, but I like I like all of the things that you're saying, but I'm not going to support, I don't think, the creation of that. I would love to see us do that work as a full committee or in ad hoc settings. Ms. Busansky. Well, I just want to say I think that um, you know student achievement is one of the primary responsibilities of the school committee. So like you said, all of these um, subcommittees speak, each and one of them speaks to our responsibilities, but if we get rid of curriculum and we don't replace it with something like student success or something of that ilk, then we really, I think, are not really doing our job. And while I agree there are some hot button issues that get, you know, rediscussed all over again as a full committee. I do think that every school committee, every subcommittee has a lot has examples of where we've saved this full committee a lot of time by being able to hash out issues in a more in depth way, invite the experts or the key stakeholders to key stakeholders to the table and get those issues decided and then bring that uh, summarize that discussion to the full commit full school committee and make a vote and I think it does um, I think it's a much more efficient use of our time and I think getting an ad hoc committee off the ground is just takes a lot more time and work and if we have something like a student success committee just like with rules and policies just like with budget and property and all the others then we can just be we can move more efficiently in getting done what we need to do but I think we have a primary responsibility to look into student achievement, and we can't do that as effectively on a one meeting a night, one meeting a month, where you know the superintendent does a great job reporting out to us, but we can't really dig into it maybe the way that we really need to, and so we can really get some things done that we can't get done in another fashion. Okay, just to that, so in your proposal, were you saying that you'd be meeting more than monthly? I just was I'm trying to understand I forgot. I, what I, said my, periodic. My, I said periodic. I said periodic. Okay, right, I just was to know what the. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to meet annually to at least annually to discuss with Dr. Provost. So periodically. Okay. But I think we want to potentially meet more often. I said periodically. Okay. I ultimately agree with Ms. Fallon. Well, I was also part of the committee, and all of Mr. Dahlia is really compelling to me. And then I think of our rules and policy committee meeting, subcommittee meetings, and I was like, no way. Do I want a full committee in that? I understand what you're saying, and I, I agree to some extent. But I do think that there's a role for kind of hashing out some of the details that we don't actually go over in these meetings. Um, I like. I'm very interested in what you're saying. And so when Mr. Downey said no meetings at all, I felt this is actually what we're doing, and perhaps that's where we do need to expand our monthly meetings, sub periodically. And this is what we focus on. We don't approve things, or you know what I mean. This is actually what we do focus on for a few more meetings. And it's not a subcommittee. It is where I could hear, or we all could hear each other, you know, in real time and not um, have it reported out to us. That it is so integral to what we're doing 
um, that I do want to hear everyone's voice for the first time. So for me, that's where I, I don't like this as a subcommittee. I like this as a, an extra, and I would of course be able, you know, wanting to do extra meetings on that. But I still like this. These are our three charges. This is what it is. Let's focus on it, um, and then bring that back here. Um, but this stuff, I do think it's it's the core of who we are, and we should be spending more time um, doing it. So as a committee, you mean? as a as a full committee, yeah. Um, yes, Ms. Voss. I'll just I'll just follow that up. I it's clear to me that we should be spending a lot more time thinking about student achievement, how we get to student success, whatever, however we define that. We haven't discussed that. Um, so if this group wants to meet more often, and you know, if, if that's what's coming out of this discussion, I'd like to perhaps add that to. Um, Figuring out when that's going to happen, it needs to be a priority. I, I might have named it something different, but I generally like Mr. Kaufman's view of what this fourth committee might take on. And in what he read, that is actually very much what I envision, what we used to call the curriculum committee, the scope of things. And I thank you because I think this was a question we've had is exactly what does this committee cover? Um, and these are things that are to me just as important as what these other committees cover. If we want to do it collectively, we have to make that a priority and actually do it. Where I see, and as Mr. Kaufman read, his vision for this as this being pretty helpful, having some group of people who can also take on the lower level stuff and bring it back, or, or not lower level, but stuff that really needs to be worked out. For example, the RFP for figuring out the math consultant. That's a place where a subcommittee maybe can meet with Dr. Provost and bring in a conversation about it. We're looking over um, data and what's going to be presented and keeping some of these meetings from going to midnight so that they're a little more streamlined with what makes more sense. But if we want to add extra meetings and do that at a committee level, that's another way of doing it. I do want to share, I, I, I remain, I don't know what the word is, um, the way this bubbled up um, is it doesn't sit well with me yet, and um, I, I guess I want to clarify one thing that I heard over and over again in different contexts, which is most schools don't have curriculum committees, and maybe they don't call it that, or most school districts. So if you look at the you know, for better or worse, I don't know how to pick which 300 plus districts I'm going to look at. So I pick the ones that are ranked in the top 20 because I like to think about us having um, an outstanding school system. I think we all want that. Um, and if you look at those and you start looking at what committees they have, I'll share that briefly. I skipped charter schools and regional schools and Boston public schools because Boston public schools are huge and I don't know how to think about their school committee. But Number four on the list is the first one that's maybe comparable to us. Number four, ranked in Massachusetts, Lenox Memorial High School. Their subcommittees include one called Learning and Teaching. Um, Hopkin, Hopkinton High School, number five, everything is ad hoc. Ad hoc. Seven, Medfield Senior High. No, ad, everything is ad hoc, but they talk specifically about curriculum and how it's important. Um, eight, number eight, Dover Sherburn, no standing committees. Number nine, Arlington, six standing committees, including one that's called District Accountability Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. And I think Mr. Kaufman combined that very nicely into a much shorter mouthful. Um, Ten is a bus in public school. Eleven, Belmont, three standing committees, including one called Curriculum and Instruction Subcommittee. Number 12 is a regional school. Number 13, Newton, no standing subcommittees. Number 14, Lexington has um, things they call topic subgroup committees and one is called curriculum. Number 15, Weston has one, has no standing committees. They have a subgroup called homework working group. Um, 16, no, Harvard, no standing committees. 17, Duxbury, no standing committees. 18, Needham, no standing committees. Have um, several listed ad hoc committees, including Technology Advisory Board, which is another thing that we might consider. Um, 19, Sharon, no standing com committees and nothing apparent on website for subcommittees. 
Number 20, Wellesley. Again, no standing committees. They're all ad hoc. Last year they appeared to have a policy subcommittee. So I, could, I did some local ones too. It doesn't really differ. But actually, if you don't have a... Um, if, if, you, if you have committees, most of them do have something related to curricular. It, it's very unusual if you have standing committees to not have one. And I'm just putting that out there because that was not what was reported at this meeting. Um, most, of these, most of these districts have no subcommittees. It sounds like they've listened to my wisdom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and if you go on the MASC website, there's a database, and maybe a third of the districts are actually in it, and you can go to them, and every single one I clicked on had no standing committees. We're not on it. Okay. No. I don't want to open a statistics discussion, but is there a way that you can correlate the, the performance with subcommittee composition? Do you have a data? <laughs> no, can I, you I, plot I'm that data for me? To, I'm actually no. not trying to make a joke out of it. I'm not trying to make a joke no, either, but I'm just I'll saying... i really clear with this. Yeah, I'm just um, saying you're, you're drawing... It seemed like you're drawing a conclusion. Nope. What I'm saying is um, there has been different voices that say curricular subcommittees, call it what you want, learning, teaching, curricular, this general sense of what Mr. Kaufman's description was. Um, we've been told that this is a very unusual thing for a school committee to have, okay? And what I'm trying to show is I don't think it's all that unusual. Um, Glenn Kauschner, I don't know how it says last year, Kuchner, um, said it wasn't all that unusual to have. And I, and I want to clarify that as we're about to vote on eliminating this committee that a lot of high-performing school districts have something either that looks like this or they do it in a completely different way where they make these ad hoc committees at the beginning of the year to focus on what they're focusing on. Um, they're two different methods. But to just wipe out this idea that we're going to have a subcommittee that deals with something about student achievement, student success, whatever you want to call it, curricular. I don't view curriculum the same way some of you do. I, I have a very much broader view of it. Um, whatever you call it, that we're going to wipe it out. I don't want us to wipe it out because we think nobody else has it. Okay? Because I, a lot of places do have it. I am absolutely baffled where this is coming from because the only person who said this isn't the norm or where it's not coming from was Mr. Kaufman who said he spoke with Glenn Kucher and he gave, I just rewatched the meeting and he said you threw out the number of 20% and which shocked me. I thought it would be significantly higher the number of school committees that had a policy subcommittee. And when you read to me these numbers of school districts that have no standing committees, I mean, that sounded to me like the majority. So I, I don't know how that's an argument in favor of maintaining a curriculum subcommittee. And when you say it's more of the same of locally, I spoke with the chair and the vice chair at Amherst um, yesterday, and they do have these same three subcommittees. We often hold them up as an example because they ran into the same problem. They are of the same opinion that the curriculum gets into a gray area. What is our role in curriculum and what should it be? And so they pretty much said that their view on it is what we were suggesting, that when it comes to a question of policy or budget as a result of a change in curriculum, that's when we would vote on it. And otherwise, they leave it to their teachers, administrators, and the director of curriculum to make curriculum decisions. Um, the only exception is when it is, in fact, sort of related to policy, the intersection of policy, they will be taking a vote as a committee on whether or not to change to a bilingual program in November. But beyond that, I mean, there are local districts who are doing exactly what we're suggesting. Um, Longmeadow also I spoke with, they do not have a curriculum subcommittee. <coughs> Um, Sudbury, no curriculum subcommittee, and I know they're a high achieving district. Um, Hadley has a policy and curriculum group because they feel a uh, subcommittee because they feel like the only point where a school committee should be weighing in on curriculum is where it intersects with policy. So I think we could pick and choose examples from all of the school districts all over, but when it comes down to it, we've all expressed our reservations about having a curriculum subcommittee, what its charge is what its uh, limitations are and I feel like they're what what uh, Mr. Kaufman's saying we can achieve we should be doing as a full committee you're right that is really important work I am willing to have more meetings if we can all focus more on student achievement but I don't know why we would why we would maintain the curriculum committee at this point with all of the doubts that we've had over the years about its function and responsibilities and the appropriateness 
I don't know who had their hand up first, Ms. Voss or Mr. Kopp. I wasn't going to respond to Laura specifically. Yeah. I had some other responses. Can I respond? So going to yeah, respond. I, I, I would like to. Um. I just want to, but, but I just want to be clear. The we. There's a main motion, but then there's a very specific <laughs> amendment that we have to first deal with, which is the amendment to Ms. Mr. Kaufman's amendment. Okay. So, can I respond to? Sure, you can. Yeah, I just was um, cautioning that sure. we need to also dispense yeah. with the first amendment before we get to the larger question. But okay. sir, um, sure. So, so, so in first general, amendment. when I think of curriculum, I don't mind if it's called learning. Um, and teaching and something about assessment for me that all fits in under that umbrella and I and that is somewhere where I haven't seen us ever talk about that and I I, I think there's so much that needs to be done there um, and so when, when you're saying curriculum I feel like some of these groups are thinking about curriculum in a different way and just to be clear um, I didn't include Amherst in my research because they were a regional school and maybe that was a mistake but I, I didn't pick and choose, that's why I picked a list and I went through the 20, but I did try to pick lo local schools. Belchertown, Curriculum and Instruction Committee. Westfield, Instruction and Curriculum. Hadley, as you said, Policy and Curriculum. Chicopee, appoints ad hoc committees each year. South Hadley, can't tell based on their website. Hatfield, can't tell based on their website. East Hampton, can't tell. Granby, can't tell. Uh, Longmeadow, uh, Finance Subcommittee, Policy Review Subcommittee and Operations Subcommittee. So, and Agawam, no standing committees. I tried to pick all the ones in this area. I did not pick and choose them. I did leave out regional and charter schools. Um, and I just wanted to make that clear. Okay. Um, oh, and, and, and I will say, and I said it at the last meeting, um, when our curriculum subcommittee was designed <coughs> and we had our very first meeting and Dr. Provost, um, said at that meeting and had said to me in private at least one other time he didn't see a need for the curriculum subcommittee and he articulated why and that's a perfectly valid thing for him to do. It's also very valid for those of us that are here to say well we might disagree with that and there's other things that go on. But he did also say and I think we value what he has to say and most of the time he he knows way more about it than we do. Um, he said very few schools have, or very few school districts have a curriculum subcommittee and that's where we found out absolutely, depending on how you define curriculum, we do have say over it and now we're all agreeing we have so much say over it we should, we should have these extra meetings, which I'll be happy with if that's how we want to go forward. Um, but that's where this started and there have been inquiries on listservs from our district and there have been inquiries to MASC um, official. So this this idea did not start because of a verb not being in the description, as far as I can tell. I mean, it it it, it it's been discussed in back rooms for at least the last six months, and and that's just the way it is, and it's okay, it's fine. Ms. Hennessy. It is okay, but I, Dr. Voss, I do think you have to understand. For my five or whatever many years I've been on the subcommittee, this has been an issue, Mr. Moore. Before I was even on the committee, it came up. So it really organically came up in this meeting. I've never been in a back room talking about whether or not, well, actually, I think I may have asked once, why do we have a curriculum subcommittee? But we really were sitting in a policy room and we couldn't figure out the verbs for curriculum. We didn't know what it was doing, and then we were trying to get back to what we were charged to do. I, I, I feel, and I don't mean to, I, 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 this isn't personal. I'm, it really isn't. It really was this organic process, and I do think we disagree. And, you, know, you know what I mean? We have disagreement here, and I think that's okay. But I think we can't um, take things personally, and I think it's okay to disagree. It really, in my opinion, it, I was like, I don't know the verbs about this. It, so I don't think there was backroom dealings, if that's what you're implying. Um, because it sounded like that, and there wasn't. No, and so that's all I'm saying. Okay, so, so let right me back. let me clarify. I'm not trying to say it was it. The way it was presented was it. Okay, so this was sent to the to the policy subcommittee because of an issue of how the notes were taken. It happened to be at a curriculum subcommittee meeting. Um, I'm not implying anything. I'm just going through the history here, and the charge was figure out how we should be taking our notes on subcommittees. That was the charge. That's what came out of the July. I don't think we were given a charge. 
Oh, the policy was just referred to us. No. The, Typically, we, I don't think we get specific directions when policies yeah. are referred to um, us. Of, that's no. why we're always so surprised. In July, we had a we had a long discussion in July, and Mayor Narkowitz, I think you'll remember well, you said you did a lot of research on this. Yep. And we were not um, in a line with how our subcommittee notes were being taken. Yeah, there's a question about whether it violated the open meeting law, but the, the referral was to refer those policies just like we refer I mean they were referred yes that was the purpose of yeah. it. Through that and I do that yeah and you know we don't at least since I've, I've only been on the rules and policy committee for a short while but I think it's been the practice forever which is when we get a policy to review you know we know what sort of triggered the review but we look at the whole policy and read the whole thing because it, as you may have noticed some of these policies are just have been sitting there like collecting dust and they are have large portions that are irrelevant. And, and so what we do is we read the whole policy and we essentially edit the whole thing. Um, regardless of why it got referred to, it's just because if, if we went and just did the one little section, we'd be asked to, to ignore stuff that, you know, in many cases is doesn't make sense right now. And rather than do that, we just read the whole policy and then, you know, we work with it. And, and um, you know, <laughs> again, I, I think just in terms of the, your concern about the curriculum subcommittee, it's been the curriculum subcommittee, since, and I've only been on this, this school committee for, what, seven or eight years? <coughs> and in that time, it has gone from complete, like, completely, like, had no meetings for a couple of years, right? And I think that's because of the lack of a verb. <laughs> you know, it was not clear. It had no meetings to having meetings where it wasn't clear, like, what it was about, you know, um, you know, it was just sort of a sort of a standing committee that kind of, you know, like in search of something, <laughs> and so that's why um, it's always just been an odd child since I've been on the committee in terms of not that not that it couldn't have purposes, and as, the, as if you'd have been at the rules and policy subcommittee where we discussed this, I pointed out all the things that you could throw in to, to curriculum. And um, but they but they weren't necessarily described in the you know the description of the committee. They were just things that could be thrown in. And um, so anyway, so that's how it came up. It didn't you know it didn't come up as part of any agenda. It came up as we were reading the thing and going, wait a minute, how do how do we how do we define this? And um, and you know it's actually provided a pretty decent discussion, I think, in terms of what what the what if not the curriculum subcommittee? What things should we be discussing, and should we be discussing them in a subcommittee, or should we be discussing them in the full committee? Um, I think this has been a really valuable discussion. I don't, you know, I don't have any issues with it at all. And um, so, so <laughs> back to the thing. I think everybody's made really good points about whether or not the stuff that Lonnie has proposed for his amendment should be in the form of a subcommittee, or whether it really should be something that we do as a as the committee of the whole, and 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 I think for me the question really is just as a practical matter. You know, I, I think it should be as the committee of the whole, in some sort of an ideal way, um, because we do frequently, as Danny said, end up doing it anyway. Um, but as a practical matter, I don't know that we always do or will get a chance to, and um, so I, I, in, I think actually I will support that amendment. So back to the to Mr. Kaufman, the maker of the amendment, so we can so we can what? want you to respond to that, and, and okay. yeah. I want to make sure we now get to so, your amendment so we can vote on it okay. and get back to the full. Yeah. So um, so the other advantage is I think I just want to make one quick comment is that I think we part of why we were discussing whether we need a curriculum subcommittee was the bigger picture about what responsibilities school committees have around curriculum. And I hope this discussion has helped. I'm not sure we're there yet. But that's the bread and butter. We don't need a subcommittee on things we're not responsible for. Obviously, there's some of us who feel like we do have a responsibility. And so I would encourage us to continue that discussion. But clearly, we don't need a curriculum subcommittee in its current form. It's too confusing, the definition. If we're going to keep it, we need to probably rename it and probably redefine it. I didn't go about this idea of saying, how do I replace this with this? I really didn't. 
I thought about some of the issues that have been brought up, and I like to continue to capture that. But I really got back to, um, you know, I went back to the notes on my charting the course workshop that I'm probably the last one to go there. And the very first thing was the primary and almost sole responsibility of the school committee are student achievement, and everything falls out of there. And they were so clear about that. And I was like, oh my God, like, of course. So I said, so what does that really mean? And, and I had a discussion earlier today with Dr. Provost, and you know, can I just recap a little bit? You know, he said, I don't want student achievement to be around MCAS. If we're talking about achievement, I want to talk about engagement, who's coming to school, who's being disciplined, are they involved, what about the kids who aren't involved, and MCAS, and other things. And that's where I decided to kind of change it. But at heart, none of this will really work effectively, I don't think, if, if administration doesn't think it's a good idea. So I just would like to ask your opinion on it, John, because if you're totally against it, that has a lot of meaning, but I felt like you liked at least components that was earlier today. You've had a chance to think about it. Um, I think your voice is really valuable here. So, if I may, after um, listening to the presentation now for the second time and also hearing feedback from the, the rest of the committee, I think you've put your finger on exactly what the committee wishes it spend more time on and doesn't, you know? Um, and this is not a, not a problem that's dissimilar from what happens with the administrative team, to be honest with you. We would like to spend more time, I think, talking about curriculum and instruction, but a whole lot of the time goes into making the trains run on time, right? And that's what happens with the committee as a whole, too. So I'm wholeheartedly in favor of some kind of a means of spending more focus on what I was talking about as student success defined broadly. Now I think it comes to the committee to say whether that's through creating another subcommittee or whether modifying its practices somehow so that they can discuss it more as a full committee. I think that really is a, the committee's decision, but in terms of spending more time talking on about student outcomes, I'm all for that. Okay, okay. So I can I respond? So Please do. I, and so just because there's been a lot of ideas, I, I still like my idea the most. <laughs> and I'll just tell you why. I, I'm, really, I, I'm really concerned with not getting enough voice around these particular issues. And, and so adding a second meeting, I'm perfectly fine with that. I think it's great. But I still would be concerned how we're going to capture the voice of other people that need input here and we want their input. Uh, particularly educators and, and others, and, and in Dr. Cheevers, and it's just there's other people that I want to be part of these discussions. And then secondly, I do think that having a same group of people on a two-year cycle, I guess, get familiar with all the data that our central office sends to DESI, tons and tons of stuff that we don't really have a chance to look at, but that's the kind of data I'm talking about that really would help us to identify outcomes. It takes a lot of a lot of understanding. It takes a lot of time to understand that, and um, there's a lot of data. It, there's just there's an art to looking at it, and it, it often these discussions can really get out of hand if that's not if it's not focused. That's my experience with using data. So I do think there's some value in not having an ad hoc, but actually having a core group of people that are most fundamentally aware of all the data. How to look at MCAS data. How to look at dropout. How to look at all these other aspects of achievement it takes a long time. And so that value, I see some value there as well. The same thing with people who know policy really well or are familiar with the superintendent's evaluation process, which is cumbersome, and I got taught well by two people that, are, that have been involved. So to me, there's some value in that. But I just want to, I just want to summarize that. And I don't know what do I do now. I know you. Can no, no. no. So a motion made a second sucks. to amend, and so okay. now it just comes down to if we have other, um, any other discussion, or we take a vote on the actual amendment. Is there any other further discussion on the amendment? Which, again, just to recap, is to um, create a uh, uh, a fourth, the, the fourth committee. Um, we can I, give it the name. I, yeah. We didn't even vote on. Well, so you would vote on this first. Oh, we have to vote yeah, on the you amendment. would vote on his okay. amendment first, okay. first, and then you would go back to ours. Exactly. Okay. exactly. So they're two yeah. separate votes. Exactly. Now I'm saying that the. Thank you. There's the main policy okay. recommendation, then there's this additional amendment. And we too. vote on the amendment before we vote on the main policy. Yeah, okay. that is That's what I needed the clarification. So Thank this you. vote would be to create a committee on student success with the 
language that you provided. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 Um, I think I'm going to do a roll <laughs> call. Uh, a roll call. Can we get, Did yeah. you vote? What's that? Did get, you I'm the chair. <laughs> Can we get the applause meter? <laughs> Don't you do the deciding vote if it's. I may, be, I may be the deciding vote. We'll see. So. Okay, uh, vote for Molly Burnham? No. Is Rebecca Bucanski? Yes. Is Laura Fallon? No. Ms. Ann Hennessy? No. Mr. Lyon Kaufman? Yes. Mr. Downey Meyer? No. Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. Mr. Susan Boss? Yes. Mr. Ed Mahalski? No. Mr. Carrion? Five Okay, so the amendment fails, so now we're back to the main uh, motion, which is the recommendation um, of the uh, committee. As vote on this? What's that? The chair doesn't vote? He doesn't need to. He can't. I'm last, but I, yeah. It, the no's have it. Did you vote? I did not vote. The no's would not have it if you chose. Yes, it, was <laughs> <laughs> it fails for a lack of majority. Include I'm so I'll, I'll vote no. Included. I'll vote no. Then you can record me as a no vote. Yeah. <laughs> I vote as a it, it would fail. It would fail. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Because your vote. Doesn't, I'm just asking ten. Your vote doesn't. Yeah, I usually vote. I'm not sure why you didn't call me. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I thought the chair didn't vote. Sorry. No. Well, I know you were. I know that you started with me, so I figured you'd come to me at the end. I but apologize. that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Mayor. Didn't no. <laughs> so, um, so the next item on the agenda, oh, the next up then is to back to the main motion, which is the motion that was made and seconded um, to adopt the recommendations of the Rules and Policy Committee with regard to policy BDE subcommittees of the school committee. Is there further discussion on the main motion? Okay. Yes. Yes, please. So the main motion is the one that was presented before this? That is correct. Yeah. So I would, um, I don't know if this is amendment or not. Um, so it's different, it's an amendment. <laughs> so were we going to discuss this? I've just asked if there's, if we want to have discussion on it. That's correct. Yeah. So. Um, I'm not sure where I'm presenting. I guess I'll just throw it out there that I think um, I would like to admit, <laughs> I would like for us to um, develop an ad hoc committee to look at the naming of the curriculum committee and the definition of that so we can carry on to do our work uh, as dictated by MASC, which is to talk about curriculum issues. Yeah. So is that I don't not think an amendment? That falls in the scope. Yeah, I think that's really it's not really an amendment to the recommendation to the policy. It's not really a policy you're you're asking for an action, but that's yeah. not really an amendment to what what's on the table. Yeah. What is so it? what is it? Yeah. It's a motion, but it's not an amendment to the to what's on the table right now. There's been a motion made and seconded to okay. approve a policy. So it's not an amendment then. So my, so in just, we're just discussing. So I mean, I continue to believe that curriculum is a huge, huge component of what we do. Um, and I'm willing to let that go if we broaden it to discuss something else um, without knowing whether we're gonna have us meet twice a month. I'm kind of left to feeling like we didn't accomplish anything maybe we'll get to that next but we're not there yet on the agenda so i'm feeling a, a gap i'm feeling a lapse of how we're going to deal with the issues that i believe are our responsibility um, and since we have a committee and since we've made a commitment to moving forward with some of these issues that i think with a redefinition definitely a redefinition of what a curriculum of the name curriculum and of that of that committee the name and more importantly a redefinition, I think we can get to something that we have just discussed is our, our responsibility. So that's why I'll vote against it because I don't want to drop something that I feel would lose some momentum 
in the process uh, when I feel like we're on the tip of moving forward. I ask him if he wants to make an amendment instead of that. But because there's a, there's more change. But my hand. Okay, Miss Fell. But there's these other parts of the thing that aren't have nothing to do with the change of subcommittee. I'm just saying my hand was up, Howard. Ms. Fallon. True. All I was going to say was um, I, I understand what you're saying, and I'm wondering, is there a place for this in our retreat that we could really have to talk about this in, in depth of how, as a committee, we want to address this, whether it's going to twice a month meetings, Kate, or periodic meetings where we just focus on this. But I don't, I don't know if the retreat Certainly uh, agenda has be. been made or Certainly if that's something be. that we would all like to, to talk about. Yeah, certainly could be. That's coming up next month, October. Yes, Mr. So but, uh, the point I was going to make was that there's a lot of other amendments here besides the one having to do with there's the, main, the minutes one, which, um, which, so rather, if you would rather than voting against holding, if you'd like to offer yet another amendment that spe speaks to the reason why you would vote against this whole proposal, um, that might make more sense. Just a suggestion. What does that mean? I don't really understand. Well, so his, the reason we vote against this entire proposed thing has to do with the um, curriculum subcommittee. Yeah. And our our recommendation, but there are other parts in here about the minutes and reporting of minutes by subcommittees, and um, if we vote this down, then that those changes don't get made either. Yep. Yeah. So perhaps you might, I'm just suggesting you might want to offer an amendment that speaks to the reason you'd vote against it as opposed to the entire block. That's just an amendment can't really be a reason. Yeah. It's sort of a, it's no, no, but he can speak to his reason. In other words, he could say, I would wish to amend this proposal by, um, just like he did before, by uh, reinstating curriculum subcommittee and eliminating the pr proposed um, Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee, something like that, if you wanted to. That's certainly true. Yeah. Anyway, I just prefer to not vote this down because we also have the thing about the minutes, which I think we need to okay. preserve. Ms. Voss, you had your hand up, and then um, Ms. Barnum. Okay. Oh, I just, I just wanted to. Um, yeah. I was sort of quiet, but I, I really, uh, I really, really value the time together talking about curriculum and I think that um, whether or not we never whether or not I voted not to support um, Mr. Kaufman's uh, new curriculum or the curriculum what I believe is that we are an, an incredible body and I really support having a um, an extra meeting where we could focus on that and um, a uh, that is the, like the thing that I know that stands out about these people that sit around, you know, that we meet together is that that is what we really are here for. That is what we care about. And um, I, just, I really need to articulate that because I feel like in little ways it, it felt, and I'm not saying that anybody's doing this, but I guess I just really want to own it, that, that I really believe that that is what we all care about um, and that a no vote was not that we don't care about it, but was to open it up to, to the whole group as Downey and, and Ann both said. So So Ms. Foss? Um, it's okay. Okay. So Mr. Yeah. Moore. Um, yeah, and I was gonna say that I I feel like uh, while well, I voted for your previous amendment that I think that the um, implication of, of voting that amendment down was that then that this committee will Will be as a as a whole group discussing things that that subcommittee would have discussed. I, I mean, I think otherwise, we didn't, <coughs> that's the only good faith way to interpret that vote. Yeah. Mr. Sansky. I guess while I like that as an aspiration that we would meet twice a month, I don't see that as really being realistic. But I could be pleasantly surprised. So I would have a hard time supporting this policy without some kind of. Um, student success or be a curriculum or something committee in it the way it stands to just get rid of that whole piece of it I don't think we're gonna pick up the piece and we're gonna be able to spend that extra time I think it really would require two meetings a month which I'm all for but I'm not sure I really see us moving in that direction so I'd be a little worried too worried that we're gonna lose out on something that is so central to what our responsibility is yeah, I, sorry. I mean, I would feel better if we could vote on whether we should go to two meetings a month 
It's whether there's a commitment. I'm afraid there won't be. And then I'm feeling like it was a good idea, but now we have such loaded agendas now to bring in something that we all, sounds like many of us believe are really fundamentally important without question, then I just don't want to lose it. And so rather than dropping a standing committee, the curriculum committee, I'd rather revise that and keep that in place until we come up with another one. And if at that point, it sounds like two, two full committees, a meeting a month, means we don't need a subcommittee. We don't, that, as we discuss curriculum, as we discuss achievement, as we discuss engagement, never needs to go to a subcommittee. We won't need that subcommittee. That would be the logical time to drop it. But right now, I'm just concerned without having, it sounds like there's enough, but I know a lot of you are, including me, are extremely busy. I don't know if there would be enough um, willingness to add a second one. If there is, I'd feel much different about this. Can we talk about that? Um, it's not really, I don't know that it's an appropriate amendment to this because that's no, not what I'm we're, not. we're not discussing. But certainly we can discuss it. I mean, people are discussing it actually. So, yes. Ms. Voss. I've collected my thoughts. Okay. And, and that was part of them. So maybe I can offer an amendment, which is, um, and you'll have to help me with the language, but which is what we did earlier tonight with the math study. Is it um, delay? I, forget, I don't know what the word is, but to delay this um, vote until after we can have a discussion about going to twice a month and committing one of those meetings each month to talking about student achievement, student success, whatever we're going to call it. Um, and starting to dig into these numbers and figuring out how we're going to help um, support improvements. So then the mo but at its essence, your motion is you would move to reconsider this at a, uh, to postpone. Move to postpone. postpone. You want to postpone. That's, that's the word I was looking for. So you want to you. move to postpone. postpone. Specifically <clears throat> until after. We well, it has can... to be a date certain. So just. Okay. Um, then you um, can keep postponing it. It's October 11th. Is well, next. if October. the. Um, agenda setting committee will put this other conversation on the agenda that we're asking for before <laughs> this vote, then we can postpone till October. Okay. So there's a That's motion to postpone until October 11th. Is that 11th? Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. There's been a motion made to postpone until October, this vote until October 11th. Um, all those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay. I'll do a roll call. Okay. Yeah. Mayor Deere Hardware? No. Ms. Holly Burnham? No. Rebecca Mishirti? Yes. Lord Fallon? No. Sam Tennessee? No. Mr. Von Coffin? Yep. Mr. Downey Meyer? No. Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. Mr. Susan Boss? Yes. Mr. Ezra Hoffman? No. Okay. So we're then back to the main motion, uh, which is again the um, revisions to subcommittees of the school committee policy BDE. Um, if there's no further discussions or amendments, all those in favor, please say aye. I, I'd like, I, oh, sorry. I thought we were still discussing. I, okay. I, Go I, ahead. I, 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 um, I'm still sitting here thinking about comments made earlier with one of the amendments, and I didn't mean to apply this was a backroom deal. I, okay. I, I, I think, I think that's a really important thing to clarify. I didn't, I, there has been discussion of this, and, you know, it's a philosophical difference of some of us, clearly. Um, I think there was, I think maybe where we can improve in the future, um, if I look back at suggesting, and maybe you can't redo it this way, maybe there's a reason to just put it up there as a vote, but for one subcommittee to propose getting rid of another one, and I understand it's policy, um, without just coming back and saying, let's have a discussion of, of this amongst you. Let's get a feel of what people think, who's passionate about what, why might somebody think this is important, and then to go back and amend the policy would have actually felt like a different kind of process than the one that we seem to have gotten to here. And I, 
say that because We've had this great discussion about what we should be doing. It's the first time this group has actually talked about what our role is. And whatever you read on MASC, it's pretty clear student achievement is part of our role. And yet we've never discussed the fact that we hardly ever talk about it. We hardly ever see any data. We don't really talk about the assessment. And yet we're all sitting here agreeing we should do that. And I really think it's important that we find time to do that. And we just voted down um, the idea that we were going to make ourselves do that at the next meeting. So that's where I'm at with that. I, I'm, I'm glad this discussion came up. I'm not happy with the process it took to get to it. I think it, it could have been better. But we've had the discussion. At least some of us seem to be committed to moving it forward. So maybe we'll figure out how to have those extra meetings and do it with that. But I hope we do. I hope, I hope it, we're not just saying we're going to do it. I, mean, I would also point out that it, um, I'm not quite sure it's accurate that we've never had a discussion of student achievement at the full school committee because I seem to remember us having lots of presentations on data and us discussing data and presentations from Mr. Uh, Dr. Cheevers and so I, I just sure. want to be clear that that's fine. It's, it, yeah. I think that's a little bit of an overstatement. I agree. So I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. Um, okay, so. Uh, all those in favor of the recommendations, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 Okay. I'm going to do a roll call vote. Um, can I have your recusal? Yeah. It's what's. It's a. It's the adoption of the. Uh, it's the one. B D E. Yeah. Subcommittees of the school committee. <coughs> Yep, BDE. BDE. I have it. Okay. Mayor David Douglas? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mayor David Douglas? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lon Kaufman? No. Mr. Donnie Meyer? Yes. Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. Mr. Susan Bob? No. Yes. Okay. So the ayes have it. So that um, BDE is adopted as as uh, per the recommendation, and then the final uh, is a second reading on rules of procedure revised. If the chair would just review what those revisions are, which I think are tied to the other two policies. Yes, yeah, so going through the rules of procedure, um, the amendments that we made were in section 1.3 to um, be very clear about um, any acronyms that were used and to, you know, for example, SPEDPAC being clear that it's the Special Education Parent Advisory Council um, to add in representatives um, that weren't previously listed. Um, such as the representatives to the Northampton Education Foundation and to the Northampton Prevention Coalition to globally replace him or her and other pronouns um, <coughs> with the chair or um, gender neutral pronouns um, to adjust, adjust section two um, to read uh, a subcommittee on superintendent evaluation of three members and to be clear in 2.3 that Meetings of all subcommittees shall be each be called by the respective chair when business is referred by the full committee or requested by the administration. Um, under section three, we um, made the changes that we just also recommended to the subcommittee policy that was just approved. Um, we added the word or, adv or advisory to section 4.1, uh, the need for an ad hoc or advisory committee. Um, Section 8.1 um, is something that um, we talked about last week where Ms. Walzak mentioned that this was no longer in line, aligned with our practice. Um, so I would like to move that we replace section 8.1 with all bill warrants shall be signed by a majority of school committee members under Mass General Law, Chapter 41, Section 58. The school committee may vote to designate one member of the school committee to review and sign bill warrants on behalf of the full committee. 
if the committee so designates, there will be a report of what bill warrants were signed at the next school committee meeting. Um, and then would like to ask that we strike 8.3, which was any member of the school committee shall have the right to request a bill be presented for, for payment be withdrawn and referred back to the appropriate subcommittee for clarification. That hasn't been our practice. Um, and I think, yeah, and then we replaced his, her with superintendent and a lot of section 10. Um, added sections uh, to a, section 11, we added language from, um, I don't remember what it was from now, it's very late. Open meeting no, right. under superintendent evaluation, we took the superintendent. the superintendent evaluation language from. It actually was from the district review process protocol. Okay. Um, and then adjusted under um, meetings, sections about the <coughs> comment um, and about the dates and times of all school committee um, and subcommittee meetings needed to be posted for state regulation. The section 19 uh, minutes will be kept in accordance with policy PEDG, which we just amended earlier this evening and voted on. Um, and then added a section saying that an audio recording of subcommittee meetings will be available whenever possible for review as a public record until the minutes of the subcommittee are approved or administrative use for the recording ceases, whichever occurs later. I guess my question is whether we need to make that audio or video recording. That was what was suggested last month. So if someone would like to further amend that, but those were the suggestions. Do I need to? You could do it as two separate amendments? I think so. Okay. But only because the recommendation from last time you're changing again. So yeah, so maybe. that's, so I would. So maybe move the first so one. So move to approve policy, oh sorry, the rules of procedure as amended. Uh, Is there a second? Rec recommend. Uh, right, the recommended. So just move the recommendation. Okay. So could somebody second that? Yep, somebody okay. second it. And now make an amendment. And now I would like to, um, Move to amend section 8.1, um, financial procedures. Should I read it again? To insert the language. To insert the language read that I read previously. And I can give that to you. Yeah. Um, so that would be I'll the first that. amendment. OK. So this is the um, amendment that you just read that replaces basically about the language about puts bill the policy that we use now with the bill warrants and having one person sign for them. OK. Mr. Meyer and myself, I think. Um, okay, any discussion on this amendment? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that amendment is adopted. And then I'd like to amend section 8.3 to, to delete it. To delete? Me. Yeah, that was the one that said that any member of the school committee shall have the right to request that a bill presented for payment be withdrawn or referred back to the appropriate subcommittee for clarification. Okay, so there's been a motion to delete 8.3. Is there second that? Okay. Um, any discussion on this one? Yes, Ms. Mr. I'm just curious why that existed or why that was in any any sense of why. I, I will say back at the beginning of my 37 years, it was common for school committees to sit and sign every bill, <laughs> but I don't know that anybody looks at every single bill anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just curious. Thanks. Okay, um, so all those in favor of that amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Were there any more amendments? So the last question was, I think Mr. Coffin might have brought it up, was adding a video, I can't remember, it was, but it was um, under 19.1, the last sentence that we had inserted was an audio recording of subcommittee meetings will be available whenever possible for review as a public record, et cetera. And there was a question about whether we should add in audio or video recording because, be okay. So I would just ask that we add an audio, where it says an audio recording, add or video recording. So that's an amendment, is there yeah. a second? In? Okay, any discussion on that amendment? Just on the off chance that, you know, NCTV starts recording, it will just be consistent, so. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that amendment is adopted. Any further amendments? 
Okay, so now we're back to uh, the, re the revised uh, version of our rules of procedure. Um, all those in favor of adopting them as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so um, those are uh, revised. Um, so next we have a series of policies that have been requested to be referred to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. J-I-C-H, J-I-C-I, J-I-C-G, I-H-A-M, I-H-A-M-B-A, A-D-F, A-D-F, slash E, I-G-N-D-B-E-I, and I-G-D-N-D-B-E-2. Um, and these are to be, uh, can I get a motion to refer these to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I just want to point out that the last two are the um, are the uh, acceptable acceptable use. use policies for technology regulations. The regulations, and then there's a yeah the two regulations, um, which is where they're seeking that uh, clarification on privacy. So that's where those were. Because they were already going to be sent there. So okay. So. So should I just briefly explain why we want them referred? You can. I don't know, because this is our first time asking official referrals. Okay, so um, we knew that the subcommittee had interest in us reviewing the wellness policy, um, particularly because a, a committee member found that there had been an update made online to the wellness policy, um, well, to the wellness implementation policy, and so it had not been reflected on our website. Um, and so when we spoke with um, Karen Jarvis Vance, she, she said that, that that was a mistake and that she was willing to work with us on um, updating the implementation policy and reviewing the wellness policy, which hasn't been reviewed since, I think, 2006. Um, and so we knew that that was something that the committee did have an interest in us taking up. While we were going to be meeting with Karen Jarvis fans about that, we thought that we would also look at policies um, JICH, JICI, JICG, all three of those. The MASC is first off recommending that we combine them um, because they are um, individual policies on alcohol, then tobacco, then drug use, and they're they're asking that we combine them into one policy on JICH on alcohol, tobacco, and drug use. The more important thing is is that um, effective March 14th, 2016, there were changes to Mass General laws that need to be reflected in that policy, and so that's really the impetus for. Um, updating that um, we need to update the language um, to include the verbal screening tool that we have been using so we have we've been complying with the state law our policy just doesn't reflect it and this policy needs to not only be updated posted on our website but also submitted to the see according to the new changes in the law so and that was why we were asking for policies JICH JICI JICG um, the same change in law also affected policies um, IHAM. Sorry, this is a lot of policies, um, which is teaching about alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. Um, that was a change to Mass General Law, um, Chapter 76, Section 96. Um, and so we would ask that we be allowed to address that. And then IHAM is actually a series of letters that we have on file. Um, I think there are six of them, like letters to parents of fifth graders, of sixth graders, et cetera. And so we don't know that, A, they need to be online, but they will definitely need to be updated as well. Um, and then, of course, the, the wellness policy and the wellness implementation policy. It's a lot um, to try and cover in one subcommittee meeting. Um, but I think that we will mostly, most likely just follow the MASC's recommendations because they are based on the changes in Mass General Law and the requirements set forth by that to report to DESE. Um, so that was all of those policies. And then the final one was um, the request to refer policy IJN, um, 
db dash e dash one and dash two at some so this is something that i do want to be clear about that when you guys are approving referring policies to us we're not just looking at the policies you're referring we're looking at all of the cross-reference policies because we found out that that's not something that we've been doing prior to this necessarily years past so for example ijndb was updated in 2013 but these cross-reference policies the dash e dash one and dash e dash two were not not updated and so now the information is not in fact um, aligned and so we would like to align policies IJ and DB E 1 and 2 that are guidelines concerning acceptable use policy with um, the policy that we already have on file so that is that's that's what we're asking you to give us okay. <laughs> Last chance to talk us out of it. <laughs> All those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's um, those, all those policies are, are referred <coughs> back to you. Um, we also have the, uh, I'll move to page two, and number item I. This is a, um, this is a discussion slash vote um, to refer to rules and policy uh, for potential policy dis development, um, the issue of screen time and potential screen time policy for the district. Uh, this is a uh, request from uh, school committee member Boss, and I would turn to her if she wants to make the motion and then uh, to explain. Sure. So, um, just a little background over the entire spring, we talked on again, off again about. Um, the increased use of computers in the classrooms, um, the Chromebook program. We heard from various constituents concerns about um, health and wellness associated with screen time in general. Um, and as we're moving forward to having a lot more screen time available to students um, in the form of this one-to-one -one Chromebook program, I also was contacted by an, a handful of parents um, and over the years just teachers mentioning um, movies so I so I think screen time is more than just computers I don't want to make this seem like it's just about Chromebooks but as we're going forward we're getting more and more opportunities cell phones um, and a lot of this happens in schools the phones the movies the Chromebooks um, and I think it makes sense for us to have other uh, other districts around the country I I've seen little articles starting to talk about this. We mentioned the state of Maryland made a law, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it came up in the discussion a few months ago here. And I think we should be proactive about how much screen time are kids getting in during a school day. And I don't want to be the police and say it has to be less than some amount. But you can imagine, especially when kids graduate onto JFK, where they're going from class to class to class, there isn't one teacher saying, okay, you know, we've had the, the screen, whatever that is, on all day. It might be easier to control that in the elementary schools, but having some guidelines and policy and starting a discussion about how we make sure kids are actually engaging with each other, talking with each other, arguing um, critical thinking skills um, that aren't necessarily being developed if they're sitting watching a screen for a good chunk of the day. So. So you'd make a motion? My motion to is to ask um, the committee that seems the most appropriate, Rules and Policy Subcommittee, to um, take this on and develop a policy about screens. Okay. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to refer this issue to Rules and Policy. Is there any discussion or questions? Or Yes. Um, in Rules and Policy, can you reach out to teachers and get I mean, there's no reason that you couldn't invite teachers in on the discussion. No, of course not. Um, yep. I'll be honest, you're talking about <coughs> creating a brand new policy in an area that we have not gotten guidance and one doesn't exist. And that is something that I think, I have a lot of thoughts about it, but if, if the will of the full committee is that we do this, that to me actually sounds like an ad hoc type issue where you do bring in parents and teachers because I don't want to be dictating policy 
as a subcommittee or as a full committee that now we're putting administrators and teachers in charge of enforcing. Um, and it, it sounds to me like that, you know, especially if we're talking about not just screens, but you were bringing in, that's bringing in a cell phone policy, really. And it's bringing in, uh, we have policies about movies that can be shown in classrooms and getting pre-approval. So I think that what you're asking is not as simple as it sounds. It sounds like a big task. And I, so I question that. And then the other thing is, like, I, I it has occurred to me that our teachers were limited, particularly in the middle school and at the high school, by the lack of availability of Chromebooks. And so that was kind of a limiting factor, was that you had to plan in advance to use it be because of lack of devices. And if we were to set a limit to the amount of time that they were going to be using those devices on any given day, like, I don't know what your charge is, is how you, if you're saying like a, a general time frame, a limit per day, a limit per week, a limit over the course of the year, because we're asking the teachers then to really coordinate with each other. You know, say like, well, you you know, you used it for a half an hour yesterday, you can't use it today. You know, you have to shut it off in the middle of a project. Like, I just, I'm not sure what, what you're asking us, how specific the charge is, and, and obviously, it doesn't go as well when we just get policies referred to us in a general sense. Like I would like to be really clear on what you were asking with the policy, like what the intention is, as far as what the charge is. Uh, I mean, I think um, I agree with you. This is a huge thing, and we've just brushed the tip of the iceberg in conversations here. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how. To, so we're discussing it, and I don't. Maybe there's other ways to go about it, but. <laughs> pretty clear that it's easy for a kid to go to school and spend a great part of their day on a screen. It's very feasible that can happen. It, it happens to my kid. And I think we should talk about it and think about is that what we want to happen and what kinds of... It, I'm not saying the teachers should be in charge of policing it. I don't know the answers. Ms. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's something that needs to be talked about. I agree with you. And I, I'm not sure where. I like the idea of an ad hoc where we could bring in people who, parents, teachers, administrators, counselors, who know real different stakeholders in this. Because I think it's so big, we don't, actually don't even know the questions we're asking. Right. Um, and then maybe generating that discussion, knowing that we're not going to make a policy in a month probably. Mm -hmm. But this this group is going to be looking at it, because there's a lot of concern from community and um, Committee member. Yes, Ms. Hollis. To be honest, if we had a curriculum committee, I would have referred it to them because even though this isn't curriculum, I'm actually serious. This to me is about learning and what's happening in the classroom, and it's across, it's affecting a lot of students. So I'll just be honest. I don't know where, but it, it, I'm way more concerned about us getting into this issue, figuring out what we think about it, how we want to offer guidance on it. Um, it's not something we're going to solve in a month or two, but I think in five years we're going to look yeah. back and say, gosh, I'm glad we got started talking about that because it's just getting to be more and more. We have, we've proposed, you've all proposed a one-to-one -one Chromebook program, third to twelfth grade, and I really don't think any of us think a third grader should be spending the majority of their school day on a Chromebook. I, I, I mean, I could argue that at any grade, and I'm taking the youngest kids. But what do we expect as a community? What What is okay? What should parents expect their kids to have done at school? And I don't know. I don't know what the questions are or how we go about dealing with it. I think it is really thorny. I'm sorry. I was sorry. I was listening. So um, I'll just start with Ms. Busansky and come back this way. I was just going to say that I like the idea of an ad hoc committee. I think that might be a better place to start with this, and it would let, allow us maybe to bring in more experts, et cetera, to this um, issue. And I think it's an important issue that we really need to start looking at. And it does get into the issue of a cell phone policy, which I know we've discussed that idea here before. But it is interesting to me that one of the main reasons, um, or one of the reasons I feel like I've heard in the past to not limit cell phone use or smartphone use at the high school is so kids can use it for educational purposes. But now that we're going to have a one-to-one -one Chromebook program at the high school, kids don't need to have their smartphones out anymore. So that's pretty clear. But I think it's a bigger discussion, and we should bring some expertise in. There's the Maryland law. France just outlawed cell phone <coughs> use in schools. So you know this is an issue that's you know gaining some traction. Um, and I think it would be really behoove us to jump on this um, sooner rather than later. And so what would be, what would it 
I don't know if that would mean Dr. Voss would change her request, her vote from a policy to an ad hoc committee or how that would work, but I like that idea. I think that would be a better place to start, I agree. Ms. Burke. And my question was just to how do we make an ad hoc committee? That was what I was going to Good question. <laughs> um, uh, quarter of 11. It's a um, rules of procedure, isn't it? Yeah. What's that? We have rules and procedure, but I'm just saying that oh, she would. At this moment, she would need to withdraw the referral. Can I amend hers? Can I make it? I just amendment? want to understand what the rules. Okay. Let's get it. So exciting. Figure out how to do it. Probably well, look. Like six of the show. Had them in front of it goes me. like this section four the need for an ad hoc or advisor in its composition and charge will be determined by the school committee the chair shall appoint the Six committee and may invite volunteers to apply Six. recommendations of such committees will not be binding on the school committee unless otherwise specified okay. so then i mean one option would be to withdraw your original motion and make a instead Make a motion sure. that we establish an ad hoc committee. Can I ask you to say one thing before we make any motions? Is sure. that all right? Sure. The one thing that I keep thinking of that would be really valuable that I don't know the answer to is that we're implementing this new program and it could potentially provide us with valuable data if they're able to track exactly what the usage is in the middle school this year to know what time has been spent on the computers because there there was that during the presentation there was that um, explanation that the admin panel was able to say you know these this many students were on task on this website for this long and this percentage of their time in class and so I'm wondering if that data would be really valuable to us to know to have a starting point when we're talking about a policy so I, I that's all I'm saying is the timing of that ad hoc committee I'm wondering if we need if we should do it right now or we should wait a few months to see what that data looks like do you know what I mean I think we probably already have so if a kid logs into a Chromebook we have that data and they've been logging into them for a while so we have I'm sure the district has data like that on kindergarten to 12th graders and I think that's a great idea, but I don't think we should wait. Um, we prob we can go see how much time our kids are on the computers right now. We know it. And so eventually you could look back and see if it increased or it changed once they got the seventh and eighth graders on them more. But I, th I think this, this conversation is a bigger picture than just the Chromebooks. And that would be good data for the committee to consider. I would agree with Ms. Voss and to say that I think um, things take time anyway. And even if we get through half of the year, we'll have half of a year. Because I do think that the data will be different since we never had the one-to-one -one Chromebook. I mean, that's where the data is going to be significantly different. Um, but I think getting started and not letting that hold us up, but knowing that we're going to be adding data as we go along is a piece of it. Okay. So I did want to go back. So you're, you want to amend your motion. Mr. Warren, okay. so it's for an ad hoc committee. Uh, I was going to address the, the question of the charge of this committee. I think, you know, this thing of screen time is pretty, it's hard to know exactly what that means because, um, you know, again, kids looking at phones, <coughs> many of the issues are really different in terms of the social impact of that, you know, in terms of its, its root, for example, to be looking at your phone when somebody is talking to you. So that's an actual impact, and, is, and that's not a question of screen time per se, but it's about how the screen interacts with people. Meanwhile, on the other hand, you have, is it, is it screen time if you are, you know, looking at some data and taking notes on it and stuff? Is that, is that screen time? Is it, about, is it about actually looking at a screen? versus how the screen is being used and how it interact, how it affects your interaction with other people. So there's a lot of different ways to think about screen time. I mean, just being in a classroom, reading books is bad for us. You know, we, the, there's you know, a peak of the epidemiology of nearsightedness you know, happens when kids are reading in like fifth and sixth grade and then happens again in graduate school. You know? so, so, so reading is bad for us. Um, in terms of, you know, in terms of becoming nearsighted, 
Um, so, so the question is, is it that kind of bad for us that we're talking about? You know, it was sort of bad for us that we would kind of accept it as we do stuff like reading books? Or is it, is it something different? I think there's, so there's just at the very basic level of what is, what is it that we were looking at in terms of the issues, whether it's these social sort of interpersonal issues, is it some sort of physical issues in terms of physical health or mental health? Um, and, and how are those different than what we've accepted as acceptable risks in terms of being in school, um, which already exist in terms of issues that kids have from being in school, regardless of whether it's on a screen or a chalkboard or in a book. Um, so I think there's a lot of work, and maybe the ad hoc committee has to work those things through for themselves, but, but I would hope that the ad hoc committee will sort those things out in terms of how they look at it, um, as opposed to lumping sort of all in and one, which I think is not um, not helpful. Yes. So um, I'll just say, I, I, I think you're right. There, it's, it's a big, messy area, and there's a lot going on. There, I think there are some districts that have made progress in this, and if an ad hoc committee is formed, they could start by looking at what already exists out there. I have a few ideas, and start talking about it from there. So I don't think we're starting from ground, you know, from, from zero. and. While I have the mic, I'll propose an amendment to my um, motion, which is to ask our chair to form an ad hoc committee to take up the general topic of screen time in the schools and um, look into what kinds of policies we might want to develop or we might want to put together. Okay. Does Ms. Hennessy second it? Second. Okay. Mr. Kaufman, you had a comment? I, I, once again, I just wanted to ask Dr. Provost to what extent we are currently dealing with these issues, if you feel like um, some of these things that we're talking about are already being handled, or do you feel that this would be a bonus, or not a bonus, a, a valuable asset to the teachers um, to have some investigation into the pros and cons and the limits and <laughs> educational benefits of screen time, or whatever else might come out of this? Good question. Uh, we certainly have some policies around TV. We have practices around cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, we really have not uh, had any kind of a look at trying to combine all of the different screens in the, in the student's life and, and see if there's a way to um, address that through policy. Uh, I think that what has been said is pro as representative of concerns of families is also true of concerns of educators. I don't think that there are, it would be hard for me to find educators on our staff who think that it would be good for a student to spend the majority of his time interacting primarily with a computer. Um, all that being said, it's hard for me to, to put my mind around what the policy solution would be. And I think that may in fact be why Maryland, I mean, you can do outright bans, you know, that's simple enough because then you just say, okay, we're shutting them down, we're confiscating them or whatever. Um, but to do sort of a more nuanced look I think is really hard, which is why I think the assembly in Maryland basically punted and their law said we're going to have the Department of Education come up with some regulations. Um, so I guess I just start maybe with a little bit of trepidation saying, you know, if their legislature couldn't come up with something and has now given it to the Department of Ed, which to my knowledge hasn't come up with anything yet, I think it's going to be a complex and messy process and I really don't have in my head a vision of what the outcome will be. Um, all that being said, it is a valid concern. Yes, Ms. Byrne. Um, and I really, I really appreciate you asking that question. That was a great question. Thank you for your answer. And um, I just find like sometimes it's just very important to for it, it's sort of a val. It's getting um, a chance for people to come together and talk about these things. And it is mucky, and it might not. It it might be that we don't come up with anything, but there is something about the shared experience 
of talking about it. And, you know, I mean, we're not France. Um, <laughs> and when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's so French that they could do that, <laughs> having French cousins. Um, so, but I think that there's something wonderful about sort of coming together. I like thinking about what the charge is, and, and I appreciate it that it can be, um, and it, you know, just a, a joining of people together and, and talking about it. I mean, I think something always comes out when people come together and talk. Um, and, but I appreciate Mr. Kaufman's idea of talking to you, and, and it does make me feel like sometimes I move too quickly, and that perhaps it's something that does need to be brought to the teachers or something. I don't, I, you know, before we rush in, and I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> um, but I like an ad hoc committee personally, but I wouldn't I, I respect the teachers so much that I really want their input. Okay. Yes. Can I just say I think you said better what I was aiming at. I think the conversation is good. I don't know where it leads, but I think having the conversation is good. Yeah. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to instruct the chair to form an ad hoc committee to look at the issue of screen time and potential policy recommendations. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the ayes have it. Um, next, we move on to the business administrator's report and the personnel report from Ms. Most exciting stuff of the night. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna, I won't go through it in detail. You've got it all. You've got the final budget report of FY18. It does show that we brought our account balances down to zero, so we did not return any money back to the mayor. Um, we should be able to have our first FY19 report next month once the city officially closes everything off in the Munis accounting system. And then I gave you, as I've done in past years, a summary of where what I call the major five revolving accounts stand at the end of the year. Um, nothing terrible in any of them. We either maintain the balances or increase our balances. In terms of gifts this month, there is only one. There were no gifts accepted by the superintendent. There was one PTL gift accepted at the high school. It was a gift to cover art supplies and for approximately $830 which was deposited to the art department gift account. And then you've got three warrants that were signed off in the last month. Okay. Moving right on to the personnel report. Um, obviously, September is our biggest month. This report tends to reflect when people come or go the month they do it in. This actually encompasses two months because of the turnover we've had in staff. Um, and just in summary, to give people an idea of the numbers, there are 70 new hires listed. There were 16 separations, four retirements, and 30 transfers or promotions. So there's a lot of activity going on for us at this time of year with personnel. Okay, thank you very much. Now we'll move on to the superintendent report, Dr. Provost. Thank you. Principals at all six schools are reporting successful openings in terms of establishing productive learning routines and good culture. We have had some challenges with operations, specifically in transportation and technology, and the September heat wave didn't help, as you heard at the beginning of this meeting. But there's a real sense of optimism and calm in the district, a sense of, I've got this. Um, and I'm particularly pleased with the Bridge Street opening. We learned a lot last year. We added resources to Bridge Street. The school council and the school success committee stepped forward to enhance parental involvement. And I really feel like a page is turned. I feel like we've hit the reset button. Um, certainly there will be struggles and bumps in the road ahead, but I experience a qualitative, qualitatively different and healthier climate when I bridge, visit Bridge School this year, Bridge Street School this year. Also, um, the, the start of the school year at JFK was remarkable for the kickoff of the PBIS program, um, which I have supported wholeheartedly. I have, um, Really, I'll say that in this very room um, during the professional development day, I saw the entire faculty together coming to common understandings about what, they, what their expectations for student behavior were. And it's the first time in the, the four years I've been here that I saw uh, in the entire group focused singularly on an issue like that. And so I think that in and of itself is good. I think the PBIS program is good. It's, it's research-based. 
Um, I personally have seen it transform cultures in other schools that I've been to. Um, and I think it's very important that it was a program that JFK found for itself in their search to um, improve their climate. Um, you know, different schools, this is one of the places where um, I guess sort of the art of the superintendent is knowing how schools need to be the same and how schools can be allowed to be different. And PBIS was sort of the path that JFK chose forward to work on issues of school climate. And I think it's important for me to, to say that and support that because there have been some other schools that said, well, we did something else. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. Um, I think that every school needs to build its own culture. <coughs> And I think that um, JFK has made some wise choices with the PBIS program. I've experienced it um, first in um, one of the events they did on the first day of school, welcoming students off the bus. Um, and again, I've been here on many mornings seeing kids come off the bus. It's the first time I saw every faculty member who wasn't assigned a, a class that period out in the parking lot greeting kids as they got off the bus. It was a really great thing. Um, and they were all wearing the PBIS t-shirts, which the kids are all going to wear on Monday when they come in. Um, so I think that also was a, a really great way to start the school year. So um, talking about the operational challenges, um, the context for those is within a three-month window we're transitioning to new employees in the position of food service director, transportation supervisor, school committee clerk, and business manager. Um, and some of those transitions have occurred with no overlap between the outgoing and incoming person. And some positions have main, remained vacant for periods of time with interim staff filling in. Um, and we're still not fully staffed, in my opinion, in the transportation office because when we promoted Tammy Lieber to the position of um, supervisor, we created a vacancy for, for, for her former position as a driver. And we've not been able to fill this position yet, so Tammy has been out of the office for large periods of time, both the beginning of the day and the end of the day, because she's still driving her old bus. Um, and you may have noticed signs all around town for Vanpool drivers. Um, that's because Vanpool is short drivers as well. They're actually down four drivers. And this has impacted operations and our communications with them because we don't have the same kind of contact because their administrative staff are also on the road driving vans now. Um, it also puts us in the unenviable position of being in direct <coughs> competition with our vendors for the same positions we're trying to fill. Um, so that has been a little bit tricky. Um, it has extended some uh, ride times for students, especially who are served by Vanpool, because another one of their strategies has been to combine routes. So some kids have been having longer rides than they're used to or that we'd like. Um, so. Adding to all of this, we've had a very large number of late bus applications. Um, we've received 300, I'm sorry, 738 applications as of the August 6th deadline, at which point the uh, late fee becomes into effect, um, which is a late fee that's designed to get the, fees, the applications in early so that we can plan the bus routes. Um, this year we really have had a lot of um, very late ap applications, so we've been trying to juggle bus routes to accommodate all the new students. Specifically, we had 190 applications after the deadline, and 70 of those have come after the start of the school year. So we're start trying to add kids to buses while school's running and while Tammy's driving the bus, um, which is not ideal. Um, so. While I'm talking about buses, I do want to update the committee uh, the information that Dr. Voss and I met with Dr. Gonzalez and Raina Elamsford of UMass to launch the bus optimization study. We provided them with the constraints that have been outlined in previous committee decisions about other late start proposals and sent them off with detailed but not confidential information about our ridership to see if they can come up with any new approaches that may save money and or allow us to implement a later high school start time. I will introduce them to the whole committee later on when Raina presents her master's thesis which will be their um, recommendations on 
bus optimization. So the other operational problem we faced um, at this time of year is our transition to our new copier printer leases. As you know um, from the contracts we're switching vendors. Our former lease was set to expire in December. And we felt that trying to switch over machines in the <coughs> middle of the school year was risky at best. Um, so our plan was to have the new vendor buy out the existing lease so that we could make the change during the summer break, which was in fact what happened. However, negotiations to buy out the lease took longer than expected and then contracts um, contract processes took longer than expected. So we were actually not able to start changing over machines until the week before school started. Um, so um, we've had some hardware problems, we've had some software problems, um, and they, they've had an impact on our copying um, ability. But in spite of these glitches, I think it's been a very positive start to the school year. Um, there have com been complaints about the printers and some of the bus stop locations, but I've heard lots of praises for our, our new transportation director and the way she's dealt with the um, public in trying to resolve those complaints and with our IT staff. And I want to also give a shout out to our secretaries who have um, really stepped up because in some cases they have been sort of the link between teacher and printer. Um, so they've been um, really doing a lot of things uh, in th this very busy time of year to, to help make the um, process go smoothly. Um, so um, we've been talking about Chromebooks. I can also say that one thing that is going according to plan is the Chromebook rollout. I attended the first parent information session that was held last evening. We discussed issues of cybersecurity, digital citizenship, and privacy. Parent meetings will continue, as you heard, through next week. Um, starting the week of the 20th, students will begin working to earn their digital driver's licenses, which we require as evidence that students have a basic understanding of concepts of internet safety and <coughs> academic honesty. And then we will begin the distribution of Chromebooks the week of the 27th. I also have a PACE update, which will um, co coincidentally, I think, supports the decision to start with the middle school on enhancing our technology. We've basically come to a um, come to a decision as a group that our recommendation to the state is going to be that the new computer science standards really be integrated into the middle school curriculum. That is really driven by the constraints that we feel about putting anything else into the, the high school curriculum. Nine through 12 is jammed with Mass Core. Um, and if you want to still allow students to have some electives, it's really hard to put anything else in nine to 12. Um, and then also on the technology front, I'd like to introduce you to Piper, who we haven't talked about much, um, but this is a, uh, you can pass the pipe around. Um, this is some technology that we've purchased for the younger students. Um, as you will remember from our discussion of technology, there was some um, commentary about Raspberry Pi being a potential um, better solution or alternate solution for students to be exposed to. That's when I made the confession that I myself am a Linux fan. Um, and so, uh, the Piper is actually based on Raspberry Pi. Um, it's, a, it's a product that will allow students to build their own computers um, with a Raspberry Pi um, processor. Um, they'll also be able to program the Raspberry Pi because it does have the switches that you can connect to. And then they'll be able to take their computers completely apart. There won't be anything wrong with that. Um, so finally, I'd like you to uh, know that things are moving forward with the district review process. In your packets you have draft surveys that have been developed from the self-assessment tool. These are the review indicators <coughs> and rating system that um, the state is, or that the review uh, office has put together for the self-assessment process. Uh, I've been discussing the process with the association and with the district leadership and a concern was raised specifically by the association that if 
Um, the desire is for the district reviewers to have input from teachers and if the meetings are going to be held after school and if the reviewers aren't paying the teachers to attend the meetings then you may get a skewed view. Um, if teachers have help, uh, um, child care issues or if they have second jobs they won't be able to attend the meetings and so the suggestion was to um, try to involve more people through surveying, um, just putting the same items into the survey um, process and, and getting that out broadly. So I've been communicating with the district review office on this. Uh, they think it's a good idea. Um, they actually, the, the, the feedback's been really positive about trying to bring more voices into the process that way. <coughs> so um, we're getting some, I'm waiting for some final feedback from the reviewers on our surveys and um, I'm looking forward to launching the surveys and I'm also looking forward to continuing the work of prepping for the district review and all the rest of the work of the district in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Um, so we have uh, no new business this evening. Um, future business and meeting dates, rules and policies Subcommittee meeting Thursday, October 4th, 2018 at 3.30 p.m. Uh, school committee meeting um, October 11th, 2018 here at the JFK Community Room. And then the school committee retreat uh, October 25th, 6 to 9 p.m. location to be determined. Is there also a special meeting, second meeting in September that's being scheduled? Yes, there was a um, field trip request for Nature's Classroom for October for Jackson Street School that was not in at the posting deadline. Okay. Um, so I'd like to have another meeting if that's, if you would indulge us so that we can approve that. Um, it is before the October regular meeting so we wouldn't have a chance. Um, and there's also another matter that, that we could bring up as well. Okay, and then um, just another clarifying point. Was there also an issue that was meant for the executive session tonight that will have to be deferred to that? That's the other matter, well? that's okay. the other matter. Oh, okay. Could I ask then, would you be opposed to us just deferring the entire executive committee agenda for tonight to that other meeting? I have no objections to that. Okay. So we would not do an executive executive session tonight, but we would just defer it to that special meeting you're scheduling when there's an actual other executive session matter we have to take up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, unless there's any objection to us not doing item eight tonight, um, I would then ask for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, any objections? Okay, thank you.